Yeah, the, 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 oh, if you want to go ahead, yes, please. Uh, uh, no, it's up to you. You can uh, the podium or um, or the table. Yeah, my, I think for me either way is okay. fine. Maybe probably at the at the back is better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Testing, testing. Oh, let's see right here. <laughs> Good morning. That doesn't sound very exciting. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody for being here. Very, very happy to begin this uh, second day of this uh, really, really important conference. My name is Jude Moore. I am. Uh, <clears throat> currently a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development. Before that, I was the Minister of uh, Public Works in Liberia. And uh, this is a very, very important uh, topic. Actually, I, I, where are my notes? Oh, here we go, I found them. And uh, this panel uh, will, will be exploring uh, transfer of, of, of knowledge and, and, and technology, uh, and a very, very important topic for the continent. The, um, this year, the World Bank e released its uh, World Development uh, Report, uh, 2020, and it's largely focused on the, the, the rise of global value chains. And, and the report notes that about two-thirds of world trade is now in intermediate goods. It is unprecedented movement of parts and tasks across borders, sometimes uh, multiple times. And uh, so if a country or a continent in this case, Africa is to generate any value, then it, it's, it's going to be an extent of Africa's participation in global value chains. And our ability to do that is the kinds of partnership that we have, whether it's with China or other partners. So today, we have uh, Yunan Chen, um, uh, Eugene, and Fraka, who will be at various points presenting different aspects of this uh, um, transfer of know-how between China and Africa. Without much ado, I will now call on Yunan to begin her, um, let's see. Thank you. All right. Oops. Where's the app? Up here, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here again. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to present to you this morning uh, a case study that was funded by the China Africa Research Initiative, um, where I'll be focusing on the case of the railway sector in Ethiopia, uh, the influence of Chinese firms and finance within that. Um, and so I'll, I'll go over the, the projects that I investigate, uh, set out a little bit of the context of the study, uh, zone in on a few of the, the technology transfer issues, um, and, and lay out some of the, the, the broader challenges in the project. Um, so just to go over some, some uh, quick background literature on, on this context of growing Chinese finance uh, in the world. Um, of course, as you're all aware, China has been financing a lot of infrastructure overseas, and this has only accelerated with the advent of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, a lot of research is focused around some of the, the problematic aspects of this to do with uh, social and environmental issues, corruption, uh, more recently fears around the debt trap, diplomacy. Um, but less has been said on, on the recipient side. What does this mean for, for host governments? What does this mean for the agency of African governments uh, and, and also um, capacity building for African governments? Um, so in this analysis, uh, some of the questions I wanted to focus on uh, are firstly to, to chronicle the decision-making process behind why uh, Ethiopia, in this case, turned to Chinese finance for some of their most important railway infrastructure projects, and what have been the advantages of this for the Ethiopian government, and what implications does it have, firstly, for, for an African agency in spaces of, of, of negotiation, um, and for technology transfer to, to the local economy. Um, why railway? Aside from being a pretty cool sector to research, uh, railway projects have been a strategic pillar in China's overseas investment uh, and finance. 
In Africa, at least 31% of China's total lending up to 2016 has been in the transport sector. It's the biggest sector of Chinese development finance in Africa. And a large part of that is made up of uh, expensive, costly railway projects. Um, and, and this is, uh, it's not unwelcomed. This is, uh, this ties into a lot of pre-existing African ambitions and plans in regional infrastructure projects such as uh, in East Africa with a master railway plan and in the Lapset corridor. And railway infrastructure may also be a source of economic spillover and technology transfer. And there's a particularly significant irony given how China's domestic railway technology developed. China historically learned from American uh, rail management systems and China's own high-speed rail technology, which it's now exporting across Southeast Asia and elsewhere, was absorbed or, or in some cases cannibalized from uh, Japanese and German technology from, from firms investing in China. And so it's a pertinent question to ask whether these kind of processes are now happening overseas as China moves abroad. Um, moving on to, to the, the case study of Ethiopia. Uh, so this, this map shows uh, Ethiopia's own master railway network plan. This was incepted under the late Prime Minister Mela Zanawi and it shows a rail network of nine routes totaling around 5,000 kilometers uh, in total. Of this, so far, only two have been constructed. Uh, the first to be tendered, financed, and constructed was the, the main line. Oh, it doesn't quite match up. Anyway, it's the Addis Djibouti Railway. Uh, it's the first cross-border railway in Africa since the Tanzania-Zambia route that was constructed by China in the 1970s. It's also significant as being the first electrified railway line in Africa, although it's not actually Ethiopia's first railway. They had a previous French-built meter gauge railway line dating back to the 1890s. Uh, this had fallen into disrepair by the 2000s, and although the European Commission tried to step in to offer them finance to rehabilitate it, after a series of, of bilateral meetings uh, in Beijing, Ethiopia ended up accepting a, a package of projects uh, from China, of which the Addis Djibouti railway line uh, was one, uh, one project. And so it's China Exim Bank Finance. Uh, the contract uh, for construction fell to two Chinese companies, CREC and CCECC, that divided the line between them. Uh, after winning the contract, amusingly, CCECC immediately crossed over the border to Djibouti and then lobbied the government to also win the contract for the Djibouti side. Uh, the line was completed in 2016 and it's currently being operated by a joint venture between the two Chinese contractors for a, a six-year O&M operations and, and maintenance contract. The second line to be fine, the, these should match up to the actual railway lines, I'm, I apologize, I think the slides got a little bit shifted. Uh, the second line is the Awash Kambolcha Veldia uh, route, or the AK, AKH, uh, and this was the second route to be tendered by the Ethiopian government. Uh, it's the first segment of a northern line that will eventually link Awash on the main trunk up to Mekele in the north. And this was won by a Turkish contractor uh, called Yapi Merkezi, who was also responsible for building the new SGR in Tanzania as well. Um, the company mobilized finance from several sources, as well as uh, Turkish Exim Bank that contributed around $300 million. Uh, the primary financier has been uh, a consortium of European lenders under the umbrella of Credit Suisse. So you have a much more European, much more diverse uh, set of finance here. Um, phase one is around 95% complete, although it's not going to be operational until around 2020. Uh, and finally, not seen on this map, there's also the Addis Ababa light rail transit project, which was also financed by China Exim Bank and constructed by CREC. Uh, it's, it was completed in 2015 and is being run by a, cons uh, a joint venture between CREC and Sinden Metro in a three-year O&M contract. One of the uh, key arguments that I, I make in, in my paper is that um, in, in comparing the two projects and the, the choice of finance that Ethiopia made for these, for these two major railway lines, they differ not only in the financing source but in the creditor-debtor relationship th that this entails. The Addis Djibouti Railway, as well as the light rail transit project's inception, uh, through these high-level bilateral channels, uh, I argue have made the projects far more political in their orientation compared to the 
uh, Awash Waldia line, which is actually been much more commercial in its character. The advantage of this, this political nature of the projects has been the flexibility, actually, that it affords financially. So Ethiopia has been facing some long-term shortages with, uh, with foreign exchange constraints. And it's already been struggling to repay a lot of these Chinese loans, uh, as well as the management fees for the contractors currently running the line. At the same time, with the European banks, it has never missed a payment. So this, I think, shows that the, the Ethiopian government is, is trying to juggle and find flexibility between its external partners while it can. It's prioritizing these private creditors where it has much less leeway, but taking advantage of the flexibility of, Ch the Chinese, of Chinese finance. Uh, it, the government was allowed to essentially default on their loan repayments for a year. And in September 2018, uh, very importantly, after a series of negotiations uh, in, in Beijing, uh, China agreed to increase the tenor of the loan from the original 15 years to 30 years. And this signals a, a major concession on, on the part of China and also a major win, I think, for, for an African state in successfully renegotiating the terms of a loan that were arguably unrealistic to start with. However, I also argue that the flip side of this is that vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese companies, the contractors actually implementing the projects, the ERC has been much more limited in its bargaining power compared to its relationship in the Turkish project with the Turkish contractors. Uh, in the course of these railway projects, Ethiopian elites faced a much bigger struggle in applying pressure uh, and getting compliance on the Chinese companies compared to the Turkish. And one crucial aspect is that they were mandated by the conditions of this financing to accept a Chinese employer's representative as well as a Chinese contractor. Mm -hmm. And this limited their ability to really monitor and put pressure on the contractor during the crucial construction phase. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pretty photos of the various projects. Um, so to say a little bit about the, the Chinese railway line, you see the stations for Dere Dawa in the top left and in Addis Ababa in the bottom right. and, and here is the uh, light rail transit project in Addis Abeba. Um, the railway design, as you can see, it, it does follow a little bit of, of the Chinese model. You have these very large, grandiose stations. They're situated an hour away from the main center of the cities that they connect. And this is partly motivated by, by uh, their purpose in facilitating export and for freight. Um, essentially to, to serve to transport um, goods from, from the major industrial zones that are located along the trunk. Uh, this EPC project is also part of a, a grander Chinese uh, export supply chain strategy where by selling Ethiopia Chinese locomotives, you sell them an entire package of, of contractors, of design, and crucially of Chinese uh, technology and Chinese specifications. Um, this EPC contract as a package makes it less demanding for the Ethiopian Railway Corporation, the primary project owner. This institution was a fairly young uh, bureaucracy at the time. It didn't have as, as much experience and capacity. And so this means it doesn't have to take responsibility for the project design. But as we'll see, by accepting this wholesale package, you, you, you tie yourself into other problems of coordination later on. Uh, on the other side, the Turkish project um, from, from Yapi Merkezi constructed a, a railway much more in, uh, according to European uh, standards. They use different construction methods and, and crucially they use a different signaling technology. Um, despite using their own uh, uh, methods and technology, they still have sort of fell prey to the, the path dependence effect from the Chinese first mover advantage. So they still have to build their railway line project according to the specifications of Chinese locomotives. Um, one major issue down the line for the Ethiopian government and for the Ethiopian Railway Corporation will be integrating the two different signaling systems that the two different railway projects bring. And this involves not only linking the physical lines and ensuring interoperability, but you're also going to have to build a, a set of standard operating procedures and train your staff on using these two different systems and ensuring the locomotives can run on both. Mm. Uh, moving on um, to discuss some of the, the technology transfer and, and capacity building in the projects. Uh, in the Chinese project, uh, how, how has technology transfer actually worked? 
So I, I identified several areas which I tried to break down in, into three primary ones. Um, firstly, we do see skills training uh, on the project. As part of the O&M contract, CREC and CCECC set up a, a capacity building center where they, they have been training um, local workers on specializations on electrical engineering, signaling, maintenance, and crucially, train driving, very important. Um, there have been some initiatives to try to localize railway supply chains and to manufacture rolling stock within the country. Uh, and this was done by the Metals and Engineering Company, or METEC, in Ethiopia, although this hasn't been successful, as I'll discuss later. Um, and finally, a major part of, of how uh, training has worked has been through uh, linkages with Chinese universities. So there's been a series of partnerships with um, China Central South University, Southwest Jiao Tong University, and Tianjin Railway Vocational College, all of which have uh, a special, uh, specializations in railway technology. So for the light rail transit project, um, 200 Ethiopian students were sent to Tianjin in 2015, and they took training courses on driving. And largely, these have been successful. So in the, in the light rail transit project now, you will see that all of the drivers are now Ethiopian. However, now Ethiopia wants to shift this training back home. They can't keep sending students to China. So uh, in 2018, in early 2018, funding for a new railway academy was agreed uh, with uh, China Mofcom. And this is going to be built in Bishoftu outside of Addis Ababa uh, and will have specialized facilities, uh, including uh, a specialized railway track to, to train local Ethiopians on, on track maintenance. Um, how successful have these been? Uh, I, I, I put up this quote from, this is a, a manager from one of the, the main uh, Chinese contractors, one of the, the Chinese railway construction uh, contractors. And I think it, it illustrates quite nicely um, how technology and knowledge transfer worked in the Chinese experience. However, in reality, uh, on the ground, this has been a very mixed result for, for the ERC and for Ethiopia. Um, and we see performance between the Chinese and Turkish contractors on this they differ considerably, particularly in the construction phase. So during the construction of the Addis Djibouti Railway, uh, I argue this was a major missed opportunity for the ERC. Whilst it was included in the original construction contract, the ERC, uh, to quote uh, one interviewee, they encouraged, but didn't actually really apply pressure to the contractors to do uh, technology transfer and training. Um, partly, this was motivated by, by other priorities. They wanted to finish constructing the railway on time. But it meant that training and technology transfer during the construction phase, quote, fell short of expectations. I think the very fact that the two railway contractors, which I think it's important to note, are construction contractors, not railway operators by experience, the fact that they ended up staying on to do operations and management for another six years, I think, signifies a failure of the capacity building in that early construction phase. Mm -hmm. According to CCECC, actually, it was Ethiopia who pressured them to stay on, and they actually refused to accept handover of the project at that time because of these issues. Uh, then they ended up pulling in the Chinese embassy into, into discussions. And even now, uh, one example being in the light rail transit project, you still see the ERC trying to pull on these political levers, using the embassy to come in uh, in order to pressure the Chinese contractor to do more in cases of uh, shouldering maintenance costs, for example. So ironically, this quote uh, more accurately describes what succeeded with the Turkish company than with the Chinese. The ERC actually, in learning from some of the failures with the Chinese contractors in the construction phase pushed the Turkish company, Yapa Merkezi, much harder to train not only manual workers during the construction phase, but also ERC engineers. Uh, um, this helped them to build their own technical capacity and to build their own institution staff and to gain experience in working with these contractors on railway construction. Um, I wanted to illustrate some of the, the major challenges of technology transfer that we see with the, with the Chinese companies. And like many other presenters have already mentioned, language barriers are a major issue when it comes to capacity building. Uh, in the photo on the right, this is a, one uh, observed training session from the light rail transit project. 
And you see here in the bottom left, hidden behind the door, is a Chinese technician that's been sent over to specially train local Ethiopian technicians on this, uh, uh, it's a, a substation system. And so you have a, a Chinese technician that speaks only Chinese. You have a Chinese translator uh, standing up there who is not a technical specialist and who has to translate from Chinese into English. You have four Ethiopian railway technicians, only two of whom speak English and one of them a smattering of Chinese. And so you have a literal game of Chinese whispers and you can imagine when you're going from Chinese to English and then to Amharic, just how much information is getting leaked and lost. And so uh, just, just to say that the uh, technology transfer is already a very complicated and challenging issue and these language barriers are, are going to make it even more so. Um, I, I think I'm running a little short of time, so I'll skip over some of the other points, but please ask me about them. Uh, this is another example of, of some of the language barriers, and this is a, a driver training program for, uh, that's taking place at the Indode Locomotive Depot. Um, and this is CCECC doing training. They are not using translators in this case, but um, you see quite touchingly in the bottom left, a bunch of post-it notes where the instructor from CCECC has all of the terms in English, in Chinese, and then also spelt phonetically so that he himself uh, can understand how to pronounce and effectively communicate to his Ethiopian students. And so I think this is a, a quite a touching case of, of how, you know, in trying to... Uh, engage in capacity building, Chinese staff are also having to adapt and to learn uh, in that new context. Um, the, these slides are uh, showing some of the, the uh, assembly process for the MeTech uh, flat wagons. Um, this, is, this is sort of a, a tragic story. Uh, MeTech tried to... Um, they signed an agreement with, with uh, Norinco, who were the original contractors to procure rolling stock. Uh, and there was a grand initiative to also um, not just train domestic staff and capacity, but to also try and build, uh, build locomotives and build rolling stock within Ethiopia. Um, unfortunately, as you, as you may be aware, um, MeTech has fallen into some uh, quite dramatic political scandals recently. Uh, and so there's been a, a mixture of factors that may or may not include widespread corruption, but also uh, financial constraints to do with the changing exchange rate that meant that of the original 530 wagons that MeTech were supposed to construct for the Addis Djibouti line, only around 300 have actually uh, been finished. And this is uh, an unlikely initiative to continue further. Um, uh, I'll skip over this briefly, but but to to illustrate some of the the other challenges that the railway is facing, um, the actual uptake of the railway by exporters has been relatively low. Uh, over ninety five percent of the freight currently being carried is uh, entirely imports, um, and there's a there's a multitude of factors as to why this is. A very few industrial zone. Uh, Exporters are actually using it, and, and partly these are to do with costs of, of the last mile. To actually get your goods to the dry port or to the port itself, you still have to rely on logistics companies to ship the goods on and off the track. And so this meant that the railway, uh, despite being constructed on time and, and succeeding in a lot of these technical aspects, uh, it's still not been as cost competitive as it was originally intended to be. Um, another amusing anecdote uh, to do with, with the railway's design is um, the issue, ongoing issue of uh, collisions with animals. Uh, these photos were taken from the Addis Djibouti Railway last summer in 2018, and they illustrate after one uh, violent stop of the railway, uh, what actually occurred, as you can see in, in, from the window, uh, the train eventually takes off, leaving a dead donkey on the side of the track and a village of people running towards the train, presumably yelling. Um, and this was a deliberate decision taken by the Ethiopian government because they didn't want fencing on either side of the track. And this, there are cost reasons for this as well as uh, social, um, social cohesion factors. But it's, it's meant that uh, the railway can't go at its original speed of uh, 120 kilometers per hour, which it, which it was designed to do, 
uh, and has to limit itself to 50 kilometers per hour because of these, uh, these, these local issues. Um, and these have also contributed to, to further local grievances uh, and even to security challenges as local protests have tended to focus on the railway. And in December of 2018, there was a, an overnight blockade of the railway because of local protests. Um, just to wrap up quickly, uh, I want to summarize um, some of my main arguments. So I argue that uh, in choosing Chinese finance, the Ethiopian government in the design and, and implementation of these railway projects have faced several trade-offs. They've gained a lot of political leniency, uh, particularly in the repayment of finance, but have, they've actually had less uh, technical flexibility and, and ability to pressure contractors in some crucial areas. Um, and so you have a project that's been very fast in financing and construction, but it's not necessarily overall a, a better project. Um, I would argue that the Chinese rollover of loans means that it's not a, a debt trap, but, uh, and now we're also seeing that Ethiopia is trying to turn away from, from debt financing as a means of funding these projects, and they're trying to rely on PPPs and private financing. Um, and so, quickly, some takeaway lessons. Governments face a chicken and egg situation. Right? They need to know what to ask for, because if you know what to ask for, you can bargain better with your, with your financiers and with your contractors. But you need technical capacity to start with. Uh, and, and in this case, um, I think what, what it suggests is that sometimes, depending on Chinese contractors for this, is not necessarily the most reliable route. And I'll stop there. But thank you for listening. Thank you, Ina. <laughs> Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is uh, uh, Eugene. And uh, there's, there's always this talk about uh, Chinese investment in Africa. Uh, it's all Chinese laborers. Um, um, they, they aren't creating jobs. They aren't creating value for the local economy. And uh, Eugene did some, some research on this, and, and it would be interesting to see what the outcomes are. Eugene. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's coming. So, uh, before the presentation comes, uh, so my name is Eugene, and uh, just to give you a bit of background about this work, uh, I used to work at the African Development Bank, and I was involved in uh, assessing some of the development impact of uh, infrastructure projects in Africa. And one thing that I was always confronted with was this idea that, you know, uh, Chinese companies are now more prominent on the construction phase, and, uh, you know, people often made the argument that uh, the Chinese firms bring their own labor, there is no transfer of skill, and you know, often uh, they don't employ enough Africans. And so, in a sense, they, are, they aren't contribute, contributing much to uh, skill development as well as even employment in general. Uh, but then I searched the literature and I wasn't sure, you know, quite sure where this uh, argument was coming from. And uh, most of the things I could see were just you know, anecdotal evidence in popular press and, and media. And so a colleague and uh, uh, I, uh, we, he's, he's Chinese, you know, we often had this argument as to uh, you know, if this is true or not. So one time we saw that Kerry opened its uh, fellowship program for funding, we applied and then we got some funding uh, 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 to do that. So the, the, the whole idea is to share the, the results, uh, the key results with you. Uh, so as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, China's investment in Africa has grown tremendously, especially over the past decade. And, uh, and what you see is that not only the flow and the stock of uh, China's investment in Africa, if you think of it in terms of uh, foreign direct investment increasing, but then its composition is also changing. Previously, it used to be more of mining, minerals, and uh, mainly extractives, but now it's shifting more towards uh, construction, and you know that includes uh, uh, transport networks, uh, uh, dams, and, and, and things like that. And uh, it has also been very controversial. So, like I mentioned, you know there is this uh, popular discussion that you know when Chinese firms come, they bring their own workers, and then also, you know, uh, uh, when they bring their workers, you know, they tend to do most of the a skilled component of the job, so what happens is that there isn't enough skill transfer to uh, local workers if they end up getting jobs in the, uh, uh, in the first place. But the, the, for me, there wasn't any clear evidence when I, when I turned to the literature. And so the one key question that we were asking ourselves, first of all, is this true? And then if it's, it's true, is this very different from other foreign firms that are also operating in Ghana? And I think that was a huge part of the debate that you often don't hear about. So if Chinese firms are coming to Africa, 
know, doing their business and you know, not, not transferring knowledge or skill, do we observe a similar trend among other foreign firms? You know? So if you take a firm from the US or Germany or even other emerging economies, do, do we observe the same phenomena in terms of uh, skill development or skill transfer? And then even, you know, it's also, is it also different from local Ghanaian enterprises? You know, do they just hire the workers? Do, when they hire workers, do they train them or do they expect them to bring the skill that they need uh, uh, from elsewhere? And uh, if that is true, you know, in terms of magnitude, can we capture what the difference is for, for, uh, for uh, policy purposes? And so the first objective of the paper was to look at, you know, get a sample of Chinese and Chinese uh, firm employees and then other foreign owned firm employees and then locally owned uh, employees of uh, Ghanaian firms and then look first examine are there differences, differences in the characteristics of the workers, you know, their age, uh, their, their level of experience, whether, you know, they are married, whether they work for Chinese firms or other firms and sort of compare their attributes. And then also once we, we, we look into that, the next thing is to turn into uh, the, the training component, and then we divide the training into two, both short-term training and, uh, and long-term specific training. And I'll, I'll talk briefly in the next slide why, why we look into that. And uh, if true, these uh, differences exist and Chinese firms are relative to other foreign firms and local Ghanaian firms if they are not uh, providing training or transferring skill, you know, what are the challenges uh, that they face or what are, the, what are some of the reasons and how can we address address them. So we did a survey in the construction sector in Ghana. Uh, so we look at six Chinese enterprises. We look at uh, uh, three other foreign owned enterprises and three locally owned uh, Ghanaian enterprises. And the reason why I don't put the, uh, the name of the enterprises is that, you know, some of them want to be, to be secret. Uh, they don't want their identities known. And then we look at firms that are working on projects of at least uh, uh, 10 million dollars uh, or more, and then also have a minimum of 50 employees. And the reason why we do so is that the Ghanaian firm, construction firms tend to be very smaller, and so if you just pick them at random, you are more likely to pick, be comparing you know, apples and oranges, a very small Ghanaian firm to, let's say, a multi-billion dollar Chinese firm or, or, or an American firm. And then we, we focus on the construction uh, activities that are happening in, in the uh, five top regions in Ghana. And these are very you know, economically active regions that uh, contain about 55% of the population and also about 67% of the uh, of total construction activities. That is big construction activities that were going on in Ghana uh, at, the time of this, at the time of the study. And, uh, and so why did we uh, focus on the construction sector? First, this is a very competitive sector. You know, it's very transparent. Everybody knows what is going on. We know how much the, uh, how much the, uh, uh, the workers earn. Construction is also a very important uh, sector for, for, the, uh, for Ghana's economy, contributing you know, close to about 12% of GDP. And then we also got a sense of how many workers are in the sector uh, from the Ghana Statistical Services. And also, it's one of the sectors where you have a huge presence of foreign firms, you know, both uh, uh, not only from very developed markets, but also from emerging markets. There were firms from Serbia, Brazil, you know, uh, the U.S., uh, Canada, China, and uh, a host of other countries. And, uh, you know, wages are also transparent. You, you could tell the, the average salary of workers, and not only, you know, the average salary, salary, but even within sectors, so we could tell how much uh, an average worker will earn if they you know, are an electrician or if they are a plumber or if they are uh, a, a masonry, which made, sort of made the, uh, the analysis easier. And then the final most important thing is that the construction sector is one of the uh, sectors where training and apprenticeship is very important. So typically, it's not a sector where you only go to school and then you, you, know, you come back and you say, oh, okay, the, the person I'm hiring already has the skills. Mostly people tend to gain the skills in this sector through apprenticeship. So you know, long-term specific training, you go to a firm, you attach yourself, and then they also earn wages while they're actually going through the apprenticeship process. So, so you, could, you could track if you know, they are being rewarded as, as they go through the process. And we are, we're also interested in two types of training because the argument was that well, they may be providing training, but they only provide the training only when uh, it's required. Because most of the project financiers, what they do is they sort of attach 
uh, a clause when they finance the project that if you hire workers, you need to train them on you know social and environmental responsibilities, you know safety issues and things like that. So we wanted to see the differences if they were provided only short term. Uh, these short-term general trainings that were required or also long-term specific training that the workers will need to be able to uh, uh, move on to other, other jobs or for their career pro, uh, advancement. So this is the summary of the data we, we collected about the, about, the, about the workers. You know, we have data on their education, uh, years of experience, tenure, and that is how long they've been with a Chinese firm and or the, uh, uh, other firms, whether the worker is married, whether they belong to a union, that, uh, that helps them to bargain for, uh, uh, for their wages, and then their age, and if they receive training, a training or not. So to answer the first question, we look at the you know, characteristics of uh, the various firm ownership. So the first part you see at the top is Chinese-owned firms. The second one is other foreign-owned firms. And the last one is locally-owned uh, enterprises. And then we first we check their years of operation in Ghana. What you tend to see is that the Ch Chinese firms tend to, be, uh, tend to be younger, on average operating for about uh, 13 to 14 years, and then other foreign firms just a, a bit you know, older by about a year. And uh, uh, local firms tend to be, you know, the oldest. Obviously, you know, they are Ghanaian-owned firms, so they are long. But then if you look at total employment, you don't see any significant differences, right? The average uh, Chinese firms has about 220 employees. The same is true for other uh, foreign-owned firms. And so then the next question is, what is the composition? Are all these workers uh, Chinese uh, uh, employees, or are they not? So we look at the share of employees that are hired locally, and what you observe is that you know, about 90% of them are actually uh, 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 Ghanaian, Ghanaian employees. And uh, this is also true for other foreign-owned firms. And then the, the interesting thing is that if you, even if you look at the Ghanaian-owned firms, you know, they even have a lot uh, more foreign uh, employees than the, the Chinese firms them, themselves. And the reason is that sometimes they need, especially at the higher level, they need uh, skills that uh, they told us they couldn't find locally, so they have to rely elsewhere uh, on employees from elsewhere. And then also we divide the, the workers into two. We want to look at their skills. Let me look at my presentation from here. Uh, we want to look at uh, the share of the workers that are skilled. And what you see is that the, the for other foreign-owned firms tend to have about you know 90 uh, percent. Of, of skilled workers hired locally, slightly bigger than the, uh, the Chinese firms, which is about 86%. But still, this difference is not really that significant to claim that you know, Chinese firms don't hire uh, locally owned firms. And then we also go a step further, look at the workers at the higher level, that is from being a supervisor or manager. Uh, and uh, you, know, you also observe that actually the Chinese firms tend to have uh, uh, a lot of locally, uh, locally hired uh, managers or supervisors relative to other, other foreign-owned firms. And then now we turn to the attributes of, uh, of these workers. We want to see if you know, the attributes are different. So the, the argument is, are they hiring from the same pool of uh, workers, or are there some significant differences with them, within them? And then you know, the, uh, the asterisk will tell you if the, the we observe any significant differences. And actually, what you see is that you don't see any significant differences in terms of age, in terms of education, in terms of the, marriage, uh, the marital status of the employees between Chinese and other foreign-owned firms and local firms. And roughly, a similar percentage of them are, you know, be belong to union. Unionship. The only difference you see is that Chinese employees tend to stay almost a year shorter, you know, in the Chinese firms than they do in uh, in, in other foreign firms. But then I wasn't surprised about this because if you also look at the the age, you know, although we don't observe any statistical differences, the Chinese employees tend to be younger, you know, and the literature tells us that younger employees tend to be more mobile, so they stay for a shorter period and then and then they move on. So a duration of 10 months for me wasn't really that uh, much, much of a concern to claim that maybe you know, they are living for other reasons. And then we statistically, uh, we, oh sorry, this was the one I was presenting about. So here we, we statistically test for 
any differences. So it's a worker, the question we ask here, is a worker less likely to be trained uh, or receive short-term training if they work for a Chinese firm? You know? And then the, 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 the results that I've marked in red actually tells you that the probability that a worker will train if they work for a Chinese firm is, you know, is positive and significant, about 25% you know, likelihood that you know, a, a local employee or even a foreign employee working for a Chinese firm has a 25% chance of being, of being trained. And then if you move on a step further and then you, you, you add uh, uh, foreign firms, you observe that the probability of being trained if you work for a Chinese firm is actually higher. You know, it's about 35 percent, but then uh, you know, for foreign firms, it's about about uh, about 24 percent. So again, you don't see any any significant. Uh, 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 first of all, you cannot claim that the Chinese firms are not offering training. There is a positive evidence that they offer training, and that in, in, for short term uh, general training, they actually train their employees more than other foreign owned firms and uh, locally owned Ghanaian firms. And then we do that the same thing for long-term uh, specific training. So this is uh, uh, training that goes beyond a year or more, up to in, in most cases three to four years. So you know you, you stay with the firm, you work for the firm, they pay you, but then they train you as a plumber or as a as a you know as a as a stone layer or as an as an electrician. And again, here you observe that you know there is a positive uh, effect of working for a Chinese uh, business. You are. Again, about 25% likely to, uh, uh, about 8% likely to obtain uh, long-term specific training if you work for a Chinese firm. And then when you add other, other foreign-owned firms, you know, they also contribute positively to, uh, to training, but here you don't see any significant difference. So on, on average, in terms of a worker, the likelihood of a worker receiving long-term specific training, there is no difference between foreign, other foreign-owned firms and, then, and, uh, and Chinese enterprises. And then finally, we move on to ask uh, enterprises. Here, we group all firms into you know, the same group. We don't distinguish. And then we ask them, what are the challenges that they face if they want to offer training to their uh, workers? And the biggest uh, constraint is in the low level of uh, education. So in the construction, the construction sector is very technical, and most of the businesses, firms were telling us some of the workers come, they don't even know how to you know, do simple measurements, simple mathematics, simple calculation. And so trying to uh, impact them with uh, new skills tend to be uh, a very significant challenge. And then the second one is also low retention rate. So the construction firms tend to compete uh, with the mining, with the mining sector, because the skills that they, the workers get in the construction, most of them can also, you know, transfer the same skill to the mining sectors, and they get the training for free. Because if you look at the the last constraint, you know, cost of training, 75% of firms say they are willing to uh, say they are willing to train the workers. The issue is not about the money. So the workers move to the firm, the construction businesses, they get the training, but then you know they go to the mining sector where the returns are higher. So it's very difficult for uh, these construction firms to, to retain the workers. And so if it's difficult to retain a worker, you know, simple economics will suggest why train them if you know they are going to disappear in the next uh, uh, couple of months or once you, you, you invest in them. And then also the third point was the short duration of construction projects. So usually these construction projects tend to last a year, maximum two years, three years for very complicated projects like airports and stuff. And so if uh, firms do not have a long time horizon that after the, uh, the project ends, they have another contract, they tend to, you know, uh, they tend to, to train uh, workers less. And as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, language also tends to be a significant, a significant barrier. And one of the things I, we also observed was that the Chinese companies tend to have slightly higher uh, uh, workforce, you know, on average about two to three percent more because they also require a lot of translators relative to uh, uh, you know, firms from Canada, US. But then it, it was also true for those from uh, uh, Brazil and, and uh, Serbia as well. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go to uh, Dr. Frank Arban, who uh, whose uh, research interest is in the um, uh, transfer of, of technology, but in the um, power sector. Um, 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for having me here, first of all, and for being invited to this really exciting conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about SaaS technology transfer in the hydropower sector. And I'm going to have a case study from the Bui Dam in Ghana, but also the Kamche Dam in Cambodia. And this is obviously about China Africa, so why am I talking about Southeast Asia? Really because um, comparative studies are so useful just to learning what's going on somewhere else and where you have similar firms or maybe even the same firms and the same CNCs to work on projects that are similar, but then the outcomes are quite different. So this is what I'm going to discuss today. Um, so large hydropower has really been having a revival the last few years because of climate change mitigation, because it's being considered as a low carbon, climate friendly energy source. And also because there's still 1.1 million people around the world who don't have access to electricity. So many governments are really seeing large hydro as an opportunity to reduce energy poverty. And then what we see is that the Chinese dam builders are really at the forefront of this. So there's mega projects such as the Three Gorges Dam, 22 gigawatts, that's huge. And the Chinese dam builders are really having a global coverage and are considered to be quite advanced in their technologies as well. Um, this is partly driven by the government's going out policy, but then also just by accessing new markets and having a really good business opportunities in other countries, such as in Africa. The data is quite sketchy, and it really has to be treated with caution. So there are several databases that come to different numbers. Um, one of the more accepted databases is the one by International Rivers, which about a few years ago was estimating that there were about 300 overseas dams built and financed by China across the world. But these are those that have been built. These are those that are under construction. These are those that are in the pipeline. But actually, they might not be built. Many of these will probably never be built because there are political arrangements that are falling through. Um, the financiers might be pulling out. I think there was a really good study a few years ago um, by Kari that was actually looking into what was going on really in sub-Saharan Africa, and then looking at that actually under construction there were, I think, about 20 dams, um, another 15 which were in the pipeline. And I think that's um, very useful to go back and actually look into uh, what is really in there in the data and which ones are actually being built and which ones would probably never be built. Um, so you have large state-owned enterprises, some private companies as well, um, leading these development is Sino Hydro, but also Three Gorges, um, develop Three quarters and a few other large players. And you have funding from Exxon Bank, from the Chinese Development Bank, and a few others. And this is really the case that is driving it. This is a graph that shows how many people have access to electricity already in Sub-Saharan Africa and how many are still lacking. And you can see, really see that the darker area is um, what's happening in 2012 and then also estimates for 2040 when there's still quite a lot of people that don't have access to electricity and this is why governments are really keen on investing in large hydro. Then the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has made these estimates of where Chinese energy investments are going. In Africa, it's about 50% in the hydropower sector but also in coal-fired generation, in gas fire generation, uh, in oil, and also more in renewables, in solar and in wind. And this is a map of the current investments by China and Africa. So you can see this is really spread sorry, all over the continent. And this is really very different types of energy. Um, fossil fuels, renewables, so very varied investments really. What I'm presenting here is based on a um, research project that has been going on for four years, which was a comparative study of Chinese hydropower dams in Africa and in Asia. It was funded by the UK Economics and Research Council. And I really have to credit a lot of my colleagues um, who are based at Tsinghua University, at Nottingham Ningbo University, at the University of Ghana, CDRI um, in Cambodia. And um, this was during a time where I was still based at SOAS at the University of London, so that's the organization that led um, the work. And it was four dams that we were looking at, so the Bui Dam in Ghana, the Kamcha Dam in Cambodia, the Bakun Dam in Malaysia, in Borneo, and the Samfara Dam in Nigeria, which is an example of a dam that was actually never built, because it was kind of a pet project of the government, 
who was then not re-elected. And I think that's really useful to learn from this as well and see where many of these investments are kind of examples of what might happen, but then it never happens because the investors pull out or the political climate is changing. And we see this a lot in the damp sector, actually. So overall, it was 10 organizations from seven countries and about 20 plus researchers. Um, so it was these four case studies and about 150 interviews that we did all together across these countries, also in China, with some of the local communities, the people who worked on these dams, um, also the Chinese firms and the investors, the policymakers, and then also in the African and the Asian context, um, the policymakers here and NGOs and other um, business associations and experts. There were also 40 focus group discussions with the local communities, many who had been working on the dams um, as laborers or even as translators for the Chinese, and household surveys. And then the project was also looking into reviewing some of the environmental impact assessments that were out there, which were interestingly done um, by many European firms, by French firms, by UK firms. And I think that counters the argument of seeing these Chinese dam builders as competition because often there are opportunities for co collaboration in there and along the value chain there are often um, lots of American and European firms um, who are getting a share of the big cake as well. So conceptually in terms of technology transfer and cooperation we were really looking at all kinds of different technology transfer mechanisms. So this could be FDI, it could be ODA, it could be joint ventures and licensing, or even like joint R&D networks and joint publications and also movement of skilled labor. And what has really come out in the last few years is that China is really challenging um, this notion of just looking into north-south technology transfer and that in terms of renewable energy, low carbon energy, we see much more that the origins of innovation are really in the Chinese context as well. So, um, this has really been going into all kinds of geographic um, locations in terms of the flow and the direction of technology transfer and knowledge transfer. And conceptually, we're working with this. So the technology suppliers um, oops, sorry, are basically implementing the equipment, but then also the knowledge flows, so how to operate and maintain these technologies. And if we think about large hydropower dams, what we have there is really huge structures, very technically complicated. You have to know how to operate and maintain the turbines, the software that goes within, how to shut these down, how to generate electricity, how to start them up, what to do if, if, the, if they break. So this is one big element. But then also the innovative capacities and what comes afterwards. Is it possible to replicate some of these technologies? And that's much more easier if it's a small scale project where it's like a small hydropower plant than when it's this big and needs a lot of investments. And what we see is that the first two categories, the capital goods and the skills and knowledge for operation and management, they really lead to the creation of new production capacity. Whereas the last one is the innovative um, capacity that's being built up there, and this is really the most difficult to achieve because it's going away from just being able to operate these technologies to actually being able um, to innovate here and to build up the indigenous capacity of these um, countries. So the buoy dam, if you picture us here, so this is the buoy dam and, sorry, and the buoy um, resettlement area. So there's still about 20% of the population in Ghana that doesn't have access to electricity, and that was one of the cases of why this dam should be built. It was actually the second large dam with a reservoir that was built. So Ghana already had the Akosombo Dam in the 1960s, and they learned a lot from this and had a lot of expertise already for how to run and operate the dam. And a lot of hydropower engineers um, have gained experience over decades here. So it's located um, and at the Black Volta River in Bui National Park in the north of the country. And what is really important is a type of contractual arrangement here, because you have a turnkey contract, a so-called EPC contract, Engineering, Procurement and Construction, where basically Sinohydro comes, builds the dam according to plans that have already been made by others, and then hands over the dam to the Bui Power Authority. Um, and this is really interesting. So you have about 1,700 um, workers who were employed here, which were mainly Ghanaian, some locals, also 
some others who were coming from other parts of Ghana, also some laborers um, from neighboring countries, and, this, and some Indians actually as well. And this is what happened during the construction phase. And then afterwards, the dam was being handed over to the Bui Power Authority. And this is an organization which is entirely Ghanaian run, so it's entirely Ghanaian managers and Ghanaian engineers who are operating this dam. Um, it's funded by Exim Bank um, and the government of Ghana. Now, in terms of what the actual investment is, there's different numbers about it. Um, one source is saying about $600 million, others saying it's about $700, $800 million, but um, certainly a lot of money. It's also part of a trade deal where cocoa is being produced and is then being um, bought up by the Chinese, so part of an invest a bundling of investment and trade and aid, basically. And there's been a resettlement of about 1,200 people. And that's the issue with dams. Like you have national, mostly urban benefits and urban centers, increased electricity access, but then there's people who are very rural, who are affected by the dam, where there's going to be certainly a downside with them, such as with resettlement and livelihoods. Um, so the affected people were mainly subsistence farmers and, and fisher people. Um, what we've seen also is that there's a lot of climatic impact on um, hydropower generation in Ghana, where the electricity output from hydropower has really been going up and down because of climatic changes. So it's quite vulnerable, actually, in terms of um, stability of supply. Then the Contra Dam in Cambodia. So this is a dam. This is a sign, um, which is basically announcing this is the Sino Hydro <laughs> Contra Dam um, in Chinese and in, in Khmer. There's about 50% of the electricity 50% of the population that still don't have access to electricity in Cambodia, and the Kamcha Dam was the first dam that was built. And there's a lot of dependency on um, oil imports. People are usually having like oil-based generators um, to, to power the homes and restaurants and so on. So a lot of dependency really on, ex you know, on imports. And um, the Kamcha Dam was being pushed by Hun Sen, by the prime minister, as something really important for the development of the country. And it has also contributed um, in the wet season. Some people are saying, such as the, um, the, the local government is actually saying, it's about 60% of the generation in Cambodia that comes from the dam, whereas in the dry season, this drops down to about 20%. Um, so this is 200 megawatts. Um, starting operation in 2011. It's located on the Kamchai River in, in Borka National Park. Both of these dams are kind of at the edges of national parks, which is quite interesting. It's a completely different contract. It's a BOT com contract, a build, operate, transfer contract for 44 years. So basically, Sino Hydro is investing in this. Four years of constructions, and then for the next 40 years, it's actually operating the dam. And this is really interesting, because you've had about 3,000, 4,000 Cambodian workers were trained in how to build the dam. You had a lot of um, locals who were Chinese Khmer translators as well. And there's a long history between China and Cambodia, relatively close and um, less kind of language barriers and cultural barriers than in, in Ghana, for example. And it was a lot of young women who were translators as well. But then in terms of actually operating the dam, this is still being done by Sino Hydro. So it's really a case of delayed knowledge transfer because we have the equipment there, but kind of the operation is skills for how to manage the dam. This is something that's hopefully going to happen within the next few decades, certainly when this dam is going to go into a Cambodian possession. So this was again part of a bigger trade deal. Um, and a bigger, bigger aid and investment deal, which was bundled about um, 600 million, where the dam was a part of it. No resettlement, so this dam is being viewed as one of the best practices, I think, as is the Bui case study, because there's been less impact on the local population. So the local population were fruit sellers, plantation growers. Um, some of them were going into this area where the reservoir is now, and we're saying that now their forest resources are being restricted, but at the same point, they got employment for several years for the construction, or they can go into translation services now as well. So you see kind of more diversified um, livelihoods as well. Again, we have this issue of the production being quite sensitive to climate impacts as well, but then less than in Ghana. 
And one of the reasons why this dam should be built was also to reduce extreme flooding events. But actually, this has had um, yeah, a whiplash, so to say, as well, because a few years ago, 2015, there were very torrential rains. The reservoir was almost bursting, so the company just opened the floodgates. Um, and the locals were actually, actually experiencing flooding again. And I think it raises also these issues of governance and accountability, where Sino Heide was saying, where well, we told the local authorities, the local authority didn't act. Um, and it's quite difficult to say who, who's responsible there when you have a case where you definitely have the technology transfer in terms of the equipment, but kind of the, the operation and management is going to um, rest with the firm for quite a while, why it's in a very different context where the local government has to fit in as well. Um, so let's just look into this conceptual framework. For the, so what does it mean? We definitely have the technology being applied and all the engineering skills that were transferred to Cambodia, but then the kind of delayed knowledge transfer that's going to happen um, in terms of how to operate this dam and then limited transfer in terms of the innovative capaci capacities to actually design some of these this themselves. Um, then the buoy dam looks quite different. So you have the dam that's being built as well. You have the transfer to the buoy power authority, who's running this now, where a lot of the staff training um, has happened and the, um, the Ghanaian engineers and the management is fully capable of running and managing the dam. Um, so you have a lot of the expertise in hydropower engineering that has really been trained over many, many years. But what is really interesting is that by now, you could say like from the 60s to today, there's a lot of capacity in hydropower engineering in Ghana. So why don't the Ghanese like, build a dam themselves? Because in the past, they were depending on Italian dam builders, on Impreglio. Um, they are depending more on Sino Hydro, and I think the issue is really the, the lack of investments here, because it's such a huge investment that is needed. Um, and even if, even if the, the technical capacity is there, there's still um, yeah, so much of a downside in terms of the investments um, that are required as well. So in terms of the conclusions, um, we can really see that this is a win-win situation. You have Chinese firms that are investing um, in this infrastructure in the global south. You have countries in the global south that are quite eager to build up their energy generation capacity and where you can see, really see that this is helping to reduce energy poverty. Um, and you have a lot of transfer of the hardware that is obviously there. And for the buoy dam, you can also see that a lot of training has happened, a lot of skills transfer and knowledge transfer has happened. Um, the Ghanaians are completely in charge of the dam operations and the maintenance. Um, and this is partly related to the contract also, because a turnkey contract is putting a lot of emphasis on the absorptive capacity of these governments and of being able to run with this technology. Um, yeah, then it raises the issues of why Ghanaians build up their own dams. Maybe this is happening in the future, who knows? Whereas in Cambodia, the issue is really different. You have this very different contract where for the next 40 years, Sino Hydro is going to be in charge of operating. And it really raises the questions, is there going to be staff training or joint R&D or joint ventures um, and so on in the future? And it's something to watch out for. I mean, it's another 40 years. So lots of research can still come out of this um, in the long run, but it really raises questions also about the type of contract that is useful. So in a country that has very low technical experience in this sector, it's probably useful to have such a contract where over many years or even decades, the country is learning um, to be able to manage this technology. But then for a country such as Ghana, which has already so much experience, it's definitely useful to have a turnkey contract and then hand over the operation to the people um, in Ghana who know how to manage this dam. So what I really want to stress is really the importance um, of the skills transferal and the knowledge transferal, rather than just looking into the hardware. And I think with large-scale structures such as dams, this is often something that, that is forgotten, particularly if it's such a long-term contract over 40 years. 
And what is really important is to how to build up the indigenous capacity for innovation um, in low and middle income countries. And this can be done through staff training, um, through job placements, exchanges, but I think also in the small scale hydropower sector in terms of looking into joint ventures and joint R&D and how do these turbines actually work at the small scale, how can we scale them up later. It's also really important to have the right kind of capacity um, at the host countries, such as the Bui Power Authority being in charge, for example, and it relates a lot to the governance as well, the governance of these dams long term, what kind of structure is being put in place to support the operation long term of these dams. And I mean, they might be in place for the next 40, 50, 60, 70 years, so it's really, um, it really demands long term governance structures such as the Bui Power Authority to be in place. And then there's more opportunities for Chinese ambulers to really move from being the technology suppliers to really being technology collaborators and to helping with the co-creation of some of this um, the knowledge and the skills here. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we'll uh, uh, give uh, the audience the opportunity to, to um, ask some questions to the panelists, but just before we do that, uh, I started off the, um, the panel by talking about the rise in global value chains, and if we're going to grow economies, then we need to be able to participate in global value chains. Two stories recently came out. One of them was that um, for a long time there was um, te um, technology espionage, um, but when U.S. government wanted to act, U.S. companies refused to collaborate because they wanted access to, to markets in China. One thing I didn't hear mentioned was the fact was uh, whether African countries have a full plan in terms of the absorption of technology or, or being able to, because we know that the role of the Chinese government in technology transfer that sometimes in trade negotiations in exchange for market access, they would insist that there is some technology or skills transfer. Do we see the same from African governments that are negotiating with the Chinese? Because to, put, to place all of the sort of responsibility on technology transfer on the Chinese partner sort of relieves the African governments themselves of their responsibility in terms of being able to do that. You don't have to answer that now, but just think, keep that in mind when you're answering the questions. We'll go to the um, audience now. We'll start from here. Here. Uh, yes, you, and then him, and then him. We'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Thanks uh, to all the panelists for uh, very insightful talks. Uh, my question goes to uh, Yunnan. You, I wonder if you can uh, talk, talk a little bit more about the division of the railway construction between CREC and CCECC. Mm -hmm. Is it a result of the bidding process or uh, some other issues going on? And how do they coordinate during uh, the construction phase? And do you see any differences in their operation? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I. I uh, uh, you know. I have two questions that you know all of you, all of you on the panel, um, can answer, including including uh, uh, Judy. Um, the first is I see a lot of variation, um, you know, across across countries uh, in terms of the you know the quality of projects, uh, you know, the ability to get. Um, you know, benefits to, deri to, to derive uh, technical benefits in terms of capacity and skill in, 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 the in the implementation of these various projects. To what extent is this variation a reflection of the Chinese government's um, flexibility or willingness to be flexible or um, the ability of the country to negotiate uh, better terms of, you know, contracting, financing, and so forth? I'd be very interested. Um, to hear to hear from from you. Second, um, um, how is China adjusting to to the political changes that we're starting to see in many of these uh, countries, in which they have really high stakes, in which the Chinese really, in, in which the Chinese government has high stakes, and indeed the private sector has high stakes uh, uh, construction companies. I mean, recently we've seen, you know, right now we have. Uh, a very interesting situation happening in, 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 in Sudan, uh, which is one of uh, China's most robust uh, partners on the continent. And this certainly, you know, I assume, is, is, is going to have an effect uh, on, these, on these contracts and on these, um, 
uh, relationships. To what extent is China adjusting to this? Uh, because it de it's definitely going to have uh, some sort of impact uh, on the larger relationship. Thank you. And then we'll take the last one, then do another round. So in the next round, one, two, three. Uh, Lawrence Freeman, political economic analyst for Africa. I have a couple questions from Ms. Chin on Ethiopia. Uh, I happened to be in Ethiopia when the celebration for the inauguration was made with mm. Djibouti government, Ethiopia, Chinese government, almost a full orchestra on stage, and we went a few kilometers on the train. Mm. In the trans when I met with the Minister of Transportation, they had seen this train with all these stops on it to be connected to highways to the industrial parks. So one, and they're building a massive uh, highway system in Ethiopia, bigger than anything I've seen in anywhere else in Africa. So how is that working? I mean, there was supposed to be a line highway to Hawassa Industrial Park, and the train was to make the benefit, was to benefit this light manufacturing export to meet the stops on the train to be exported in Djibouti since Ethiopia was landlocked since the loss of Eritrea. So how is that proceeding? And also, uh, they said they employ 5,000 Djibouti and Ethiopian workers. I don't know if that's a lot or little for that 700-kilometer train. And does the Ethiopian example kind of disprove the propaganda that China is investing in Africa to countries that have resources, so if they can't pay their debt or they can pay their debt, the resources are collateral. Mm. But in Ethiopia, that doesn't exist. I mean, it's not sesame seeds or cut flour or coffee. So I think the Ethiopia example proves that China has a more deep concern for economic development in Africa than some of our think tanks would like to admit. I don't know what your evaluation of that is. Thank you. We'll give the panelists an opportunity to answer this uh, that set, and then we'll take the next uh, uh you know, a couple of the questions were directed in, uh, uh, at you. Sure, so. I'll, I'll try and address the railway-specific ones. Um, uh, Lawrence, thank you for your for your question. Uh, on on the highways that that you mentioned, um, yes. So so one of the the major issues or bottlenecks with the with the success of the railway or its profitability is to do with this this kind of dis, uh, disjuncture with with the industrial zones. There there isn't a very comprehensive connection. Uh, for a lot of these industrial zones to the trunk line, as, as you can see from the map, you know, the railway doesn't go to Hawassa. So if you're an exporting company, you have to make sure that you have a truck that will take your goods from the zone, get it to the, the depot where it has to get shipped onto the train, then takes the train, which, by the way, only runs once a day for freight, currently, mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you get it to the port. After the port, you still have to take that off and then get it onto the boat at the end. And so there are all of these little last mile costs. Um, and and Ethiopia's uh, shipping and logistics industry to date has been controlled by, by uh, state-owned monopolies. Um, and so the, the, these additional costs that come with using the train actually make it just not as competitive as uh, um, alternative solutions uh, as many exporters were previously doing. Put it on a truck, send it along the, the, the rickety original highway that goes all the way to Djibouti. Um, it, it, sorry? Uh, it, right, right, but uh, you know, it's more flexible, it's more reliable, you don't have to wait on, on um, the various like, links of the chain that, that come with taking the railway. Uh, it, in terms of using resources as collateral, yeah, I, I agree with you, you know, it's, it is a case, uh, and a curious case, I think, of it, there is no kind of um, major natural resource at stake here. There has been some talk of, um, because of the issues of loan repayment, whether the Chinese companies might uh, actually take on the assets of the railway and, and, uh, and use that um, to, to compensate for the fact that the Ethiopian government can't repay it. That hasn't happened. And, and I think there's resistance from both ends. It's bad optics for the Ethiopian government to give away this national asset, and it's bad optics for, for China to be taking over these national assets, given this whole fear around debt trap diplomacy that's going on globally. Um, OK. Uh, Faye, also, thank you for your question as well. Um, so how it worked was that the Ethiopian government, I think, was actually very strategic and canny. Uh, they separated the line originally into five segments um, and invited multiple contractors to come in and bid. Uh, and partially, this, uh, this was a pretty successful and strategic decision. 
It ensured that the railway was constructed much faster. So you had CREC who bid on the segment leading from Addis. CCECC took the other side going off to the Djibouti border. They started construction in the middle and then went in both directions. Um, and, and it also means when you have two contractors, they're also kind of competing with each other in terms of quality and cost. And I think that's also partly why, compared to the Kenyan SGR case, uh, the Ethiopian railway ended up being a, a much lower cost project. Uh, when I interviewed some of the, the Chinese contractors, they, they admitted that they kind of suffered a bit of a winner's curse when they submitted their tender. Um, I'll move on and let the other panelists speak. Okay. Uh, and what is the name of the gentleman? Yeah, okay. So to, to, I think uh, I would like to speak to your, to your first uh, question. And uh, we often make the, you know, this uh, assumption that any Chinese project being financed or being constructed in Africa is, you know, more or less spearheaded in some way by the Chinese government. And, uh, in, and in large parts, uh, this is often not the case. Uh, when we were working uh, on our research in Ghana, what we actually discovered that there are, you know, Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises and then also Chinese provincial-owned enterprises as well as uh, private firms. And these firms compete intensively, you know, intensely among themselves. And, you know, we had one firm telling us how they, you know, they were... They had a legal issue with uh, another Chinese firm that was state state owned and was actually in in uh, in, a, in one of, at the High Court in Ghana. Uh, so I think that is one thing. The other thing is also that uh, most of the Chinese firms that are operating in Ghana, in Africa, in general, are actually quite young firms on the international scale. So these are firms who will normally not win contracts on the scale that they, they win in Africa if they were operating back in China. So they are also experiment, uh, you know, experimenting and, uh, you know, obviously you expect that these firms will probably have, uh, you know, the quality scale will not be the same as well-established uh, uh, firms. And so I think the key thing comes to, you know, quality assurance, you know, and it doesn't matter whether, the, you know, the, the project is being financed by the Chinese government or, you know, any other government, I think the African uh, countries need to make sure they separate uh, the two, you know, uh, the financing, the construction, as well as, you know, the, the, the ensuring that the project is of, uh, uh, of high quality or up to uh, power with global standard. And often this is where the, where the challenge is, you know. Uh, it's an issue of capacity among the governments, you know. It's an, also an issue of cost. Uh, because, you know, checking the, the whether an, a new airport, you know, which is... Uh, probably state-of-the-art meets uh, the same quality standard. It's, it's not an easy tax for most of these governments since it requires uh, quite a huge uh, sums of cost. So I think that is the area that we need to uh, work on most. Uh, your second question on whether, you know, how China is responding to the political climate, I think is a very difficult one to, uh, to answer. But I think increasingly what you see is that, you know, previously there were issues in, in Africa politically and then the the Chinese government will often remain silent. But now, as you know, China is investing more and more in Africa, you, you no longer can stay silent because you have, you have a skin in the game, you have a, a stake at hand. And how you sort of address that is, you know, is more or less, you know, how you, your uh, international diplomacy uh, strategy is. But at least we, we, we increasingly we are hearing the voice of China saying, you know, I, recently with the issue in Sudan, I heard that the Chinese government saying, you know, they, they, they want both sides to remain calm and, you know, ensure that uh, things are, are resolved in a, in, in, a, in a manner that benefits everybody. So I think China cannot continue to stay silent as, you know, it gets more and more stake in, in Africa. And uh, I think uh, probably in the long term that is increasingly going to be uh, we will hear the voice of the government more and more, and uh, hopefully in the uh, in the right direction. Okay, thanks for these questions. Um, just adding to this issue about the Chinese flexibility and, and the host government's ability to be able to negotiate the terms of contracts. Um, and first of all, it really comes down very much to the companies and their practices. And what we see is that often there is international. Um, bidding processes out there as well, and that even Chinese large firms like China Hydro and China Three Gorges um, are competing with each other. And then you have one firm who's winning the contract and the other one who's losing. So I think it's, it's not really related to the government policy, but really to just the, the economic um, business opportunities and how these companies are comparing in terms of what they're offering here. And the host governments actually have 
quite a lot of leeway in terms of being able to negotiate this. And I think particularly we're seeing this looking into what has happened in Ghana or in other countries that are more economically developed in comparison to, to a lower income country such as um, Cambodia or Myanmar, which are just politically more dependent on, on China as well, where you see that they have more, less leeway in terms of being able to, um, to negotiate very favorable terms because they're politically more dependent on Chinese support, whereas other countries such as Ghana have more opportunities um, to kind of have better terms because there's less of a, a financial and political dependence. And also because um, the governments have so much expertise over so many years in the sector as well. And that's also what we see with environmental impact assessments where like in Ghana, these were done by UK consultants. It was done to um, international standards where in Cambodia, it was basically a tag on a bit of red tape, lots of corruption. And then the environmental impact assessment being passed off after the dam had already started operation. <laughs> and this really puts a lot of pressure also on host governments to ensure um, that they're pressuring these companies to adhere to international standards and also to their own legal framework that is in place, which um, is sometimes happening and sometimes this is just being bypassed by their own government. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of leeway that countries have in negotiating with these companies as well. Um, but it's often not, not being fully realized that this is possible and that there's different ways of approaching these issues. And just uh, just quickly on your question about, uh, I think it's the, the events are still unfolding, but definitely the more extensive Chinese investment becomes across the world, China itself then becomes a stakeholder in stability across those countries where it's doing investment. So we th I think that in the next uh, maybe five to seven years, there will be some sort of qualitative change to China's non-interference because of its extensive uh, exposure in places where there's, there's instability. We'll start with the second, she, it, was, it was her, uh, him, her, and then him. So you first, yeah. To uh, Eugene, so you mentioned that Chinese firm pays more attention to the short-term training. Why do you think is that? Um, uh, and the second is for Frock. Um, so Ghanaian, uh, Ghana's previous two major dam was built like about 40 years ago. It has been a long time. Why do you think that, you know, like after so long, the technicians, engineers, you know, still, you know, kind of catch up because it just feels like a long time ago. And also um, the BOT projects in Cambodia I was so amazed that they signed a 44 years of transfer. Do you think that's just a too long period for the local, you know, to, I don't know, to, to gain the technology? Uh, <coughs> Kenneth King, I think the panel should be congratulated on getting through an hour and a half of talking about <laughs> China constructing um, stuff in Africa without mentioning prisoners. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it says something to the myth-busting associated with Deborah and uh, Louis, and Lucy Corkin and the Southman and Tyrong and one or two others, uh, that, that they managed to do this. Don't forget, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I'm, I remember ambassadors in East Africa telling me that, you know, t uh, that, that, that these, were, these were done by prisoners. And when you said, well, I don't think it's true, then they would answer, well, the whole of China is a prison. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that's an important point. You, you've managed to you know, really look at what is the data on use of supervisors, uh, for example, in your, in your work, Eugene. The second thing, uh, uh, in relationship to um, Chinese whispers, that, that too probably needs to be looked at quite carefully. Uh, Japan has, for decades, as uh, Shimatawa will know here, um, managed to have their people on the ground uh, all over Africa and Southeast Asia. And very often, these people were called uh, affectionately, Mr. Do This. <laughs> that, that was their name, because they, they showed you how to do it. They didn't need the language. Uh, 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 and so I think, I think we can exaggerate what that photograph that was shown by Yunnan. Uh, by Yunnan. Uh, a, a great deal can be transferred um, by, by, by showing people how to do that. That is, that is widely the case, both in India and in, in China. Uh, just a quick note, it, in, in terms of competition, it should be recalled that India actually offered also finance for the railway. 
uh, in Ethiopia. I don't know if that's widely known, but uh, realized that uh, they weren't going to get anywhere near it. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cinnamon dorn -Seis. Um And my question actually relates to Ken's question and uh, Mr. Moore, maybe some points that you raised um, earlier yourself. I'm wondering, um, this whole issue of language um, and its role in skills transfer in particular was a theme that has come out not only in this panel but earlier. And I'm wondering, are there any, uh, and so African governments in developing a strategy for more effective skills transfer, and indeed um, the Chinese companies and the Chinese government mm. in wanting to, as its profile is raised, wants to leave something more behind. Are you seeing any examples from your work and research mm. of examples where language has been consciously built into language abilities on the part of those that are transferring skills from China to Africa, where you're seeing a focus on that? Um, and maybe some recommendations mm -hmm. uh, based on what you've seen. Thank you. And then that, the last question from Harry. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ibrahim McCoy. Uh, it I looks to me uh, like most of the Chinese companies that are operating in East Africa are actually owned by the government. That means if a a recipient country goes to China, talk to China Exim Bank, the Ministry of Commerce, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then the Chinese Exim Bank will then be able to actually pick a company that would come and implement the project. Mm -hmm. So my question is, to what extent is the skill transfer shown, is shown in the procurement of local uh, governments, because from what I'm seeing, the local gov uh, the local procurement laws are actually being undermined by this uh, notion of the Chinese uh, government or China Exim Bank picking a, a company that would come to Africa and implement with a road project or railway. So when you talk about local skill transfer, I just want to see whether there is a sign of uh, a, a local skill being uh, a skill being transferred into uh, uh, procurement uh, workers in Ghana or in, 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 in West Africa. And, and also, you didn't actually uh, distinguish whether those companies that you look at, whether they are owned by the government or whether they are privately owned, whether they are foreign or whether they are local, local or whether they, they are Chinese companies. So the third question is the cost of borrowing from China, uh, and I think it's something that is often uh, under uh, and you know overlooked. And if you look at the the high rates of, of debt in relation to this contract, uh, it's it's really becoming unsustainable, especially in in, in most of African countries. Mm. So you, if if you Thank can you. actually speak to uh, what you think would be the best way that the this company, uh, this country that are All right. investing in China. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we, we're uh, out of time, so we're going to give the give the audience the the panel one last uh, round to be able to just two quick points. One is the um, the process that he described in terms of the China Exim Bank choosing a company. That is uh, that's not how it works. Um, at least not in my experience in government or with my counterparts uh, in terms of China Exim Bank doesn't pick the company that does the work in terms of how that works. So. Um, uh, uh, well, I, I'm, so I, I hopefully it's not like going back and forth. It's not, and you probably went to China before, but having worked in government and having, especially in infrastructure, and work with my colleagues across the continent, that is not my experience. So it's possible that this may have happened in other places, but China Exim Bank does not choose uh, the contractors. Secondly, uh, just quickly, I think it's important for us to be able to keep this in mind, that there is an emerging debt crisis on the continent. But with the issuance of, of Benin's euro bonds, there's over 100 billion in, in African countries. 21 African countries have gone to international financial markets now. That is driving debt on the continent. Most of the domestic borrowing within African countries is governments borrowing directly from the commer on commercial terms. That is a driver of debt. So yes, China's presence and China's debt on the continent is an issue, but we shouldn't make debt 
in Africa about China? No, please, Pana, go, go ahead, answer it. Okay, maybe I can start um, with the questions around hydro in Ghana and um, in Cambodia. So I think what we've seen in Ghana, like with the Akusombo Dam being there since the 1960s, um, and another dam without a bit of big reservoir being built after that as well, is that there's definitely like the capacity there to kind of operate and management, um, but but we don't really have seen that much of the innovative capacity. And mm -hmm. I think it's partly related to that, to kind of really going from kind of small scale hydro to kind of upscaling it and being able to do that fully 100% without foreign reliance in, in Ghana. And then also the issue of investments, like who, would there be the same kind of investments if it was a Ghanaian firm? Something to be seen in the future, I think. Then the BU2 contract um, for Cambodia, it's very unusual that this is like 40 or 44 years. Often BU2 contracts are 20 years or 30 years. And one of the reasoning of Sino Hydro was here um, that this, there's a lot of seasonality. You have a dry season, you have a wet season. So basically, um, in the dry season, the dam doesn't operate to the same capacity. And Sino Hydro basically needs to recuperate some of its costs. But at the same time, it's also just prolonging mm. this transfer of skills and of knowledge onto very much into the future. And I think you could argue after like 40 years, that's when there's a lot of repairs that's going to be needed, maybe some replacement of equipment. So kind of coming to a point where maybe it's not economically that feasible that it was like 40 years ago, even though some of these plants can be there for like 70 years, 80 years. But you're coming to a point where it doesn't really make that much economic sense because of replacement. So I think that's the problem really here with these very long BU2 contracts. Um, the issues of the, the state-owned enterprises. So in my case, um, the research I did, Sinohydro is a state-owned enterprise, but I think that's not unusual for the sector. You have other European or Canadian firms like Hydro-Quebec, um, Vattenfall, they are state-owned as well. It's, um, because this is a very large scale, but we also see private investors, like in Nigeria, for example, that are operating in this sector. So I think I wouldn't really separate this into just being SOEs, but there's a lot of private activity that is going on as well. Um, the language and the culture uh, question, I think that's really important as well, and you see this a lot in Cambodia, where there's kind of Chinese schools and, and the local communities. The, the children go to Chinese schools because they know there is employment. If it's not with a dam, then it's with another Chinese company, another Chinese enterprise somewhere. Um, I've seen this less in, in the Ghanaian or in, in the African context, so it's something to look out more for the future, and I think it's important to maybe embed that in terms of skills transferal in these contracts as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think the, the, the question on uh, you know, why Chinese firms are offering more short-term training uh, it's also a difficult one to answer, but I think it, it relates more to the, uh, to the, to the evolving nature of, uh, of the project financing. Now, what you see happening increasingly is that most of the project financiers are requesting as part of the you know, uh, financing clause is, is that at least you offer some basic minimum of uh, training to workers, you know, both uh, temporary workers and uh, if you possibly can, uh, you know, permanent workers in terms of uh, health training, you know, uh, uh, safety, uh, uh, social standards and environmental uh, protection, and you know these are the trainings that tend to be more of the of the short term nature. So two months, three months, as as the, as the workers are on the job. So I think it plays a huge role. The second thing is most of the financiers also in Ghana are also increasingly listening to criticisms and upgrading their fi financing structure also in terms of uh, in line with uh, with with global standards. So the Chinese Exim Bank now has. You know, environmental and social impact assessment that you have to do, and you know, I think you mentioned something about UK firms conducting them for, uh, for and so to do to co normally com to complete all these steps, you need to offer the workers you know the training to ensure that uh, they make sure they don't destroy the environment, they maintain you know they are healthy. You, know, you, you don't want to also get yourself into some legal issues and things like that. So, I my my thinking is that is where most of uh, these things come from. And that's where we observe most. And then the other thing is with the language. The language I'm beginning to see, I think, the, I think the, the Chinese government is now playing a very proactive role in terms of making sure that at least you know, uh, 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 local Africans get to you know, understand the Chinese, the Chinese language. Uh, I know of, of a few cases, like in Cote d'Ivoire, where 
if you are interested in learning the language, there are facilities, the Chinese government is establishing facilities where you can go and op obtain these, uh, these sort of training. As to you know, the uptake or interest, I'm not so sure uh, uh, on those points, but I think as the, firm, the Chinese firms go to Africa more and more and people realize that they have uh, job opportunities potentially with such firms, maybe you know, the, the interest will, will continue to increase. Um, just to quickly address some of the, the language questions, um, Kenneth, I think you made a, a very great point on, on the sort of the do this mentality, which is largely how uh, much of this, this on the job training has functioned inevitably. But I think this, although it works, it puts a constraint on just how much knowledge can be transferred. So you can teach someone how to use that machine, but they may not necessarily understand why they have to do this, mm -hmm. right? And so in building a complex infrastructure system, you, you're not just transferring the hardware and technology. You have to transfer also a system of operation, uh, a, a system of maintenance. You know, how often do you have to change this particular component? How often do you have to check this part or this engine part? And, and so all of these kind of rules, standard operating procedures are also that's going to be the really long-term challenge uh, if Ethiopian staff and the ERC want to take over and, and take full ownership of the railway. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very skeptical on, on the six-year operations and maintenance contract that the Chinese companies currently have. Yeah, that's, it's going to take longer than six years to really build those institutions. Um, on, on, the, on Cinnamon's question of uh, language, um, I, I think just in the, in the training observations, uh, the, the relationships that worked best were ones where the student had studied previously in China. And I think it kind of tying back to, to one of the, the presentations from yesterday, you know, these informal linkages uh, are po possibly some of the more um, effective avenues through which knowledge transfer and that tacit knowledge can really occur. Uh, and unfortunately, I think now that Ethiopia wants to transfer training back from uh, moving away from the sort of student exchange model back to a, a domestic, like where the Chinese, com uh, Chinese trainers come to Ethiopia, I think you're going to lose uh, so some of those, some of those um, linkages. And actually, um, on, in terms of the role of language and skills transfer, I, also tying back to one of the presentations yesterday, I think <laughs> it's kind of interesting in the Chinese railway case that Language is kind of used as a barrier in some cases, and it's a whether intentional or un unintentionally, it is an obstacle to the Ethiopian railway institutions from gaining a lot of the, the technical knowledge and the documentation from the Chinese companies. And you see this in comparison with the Turkish company that um, is is very transparent. They will translate a lot of the blueprints, the technical documentation, into English when they interact with the ERC. Uh, whereas in the Chinese side, it was a much greater struggle for the ERC to, to get access to the same documents that would be translated. Um, largely, it would operate completely in Chinese. So whether intentional or unintentional, it has a sort of blocking power. Could you please uh, join me and thank the panel? <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I was saying, uh, even when you Thank said you. it looked bad. <laughs> <laughs>
Can we get everyone to please sit down and can I get the last panel up on the stage, please? Hi everyone, we're running a little bit late. Can I ask you to please take your seats? And panelists to the front. Can I please get everyone to come take your seats? We're going to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, panel six, our last panel for our conference. Um, I am clearly not Albert Zufak, a chief economist of the African region at the World Bank. Um, he is um, unfortunately been delayed. He's on his way here, and he will be here shortly. Um, but we thought without, um, because we didn't want to continue to delay um, the last panel, um, I'm going to go ahead and do the introductions and I ask the first panelist to go ahead and and get started. Um, while previous panels have focused on a, a particular sector, um, this one uh, looks at uh, multiple sectors. Um, the panel title is China Overseas, Channels and Challenges of Tech Transfer. Um, you will see again Tang Xiaoyang, um, who you heard from yesterday. Um, and today he's gonna be talking about the work he did um, on uh, Zambia's, in Zambia's cotton sector. Um, Henry um, is a PhD candidate at SAIS and he's going to move us to talk about Huawei and the next generation of telecommunications knowledge and tech transfers in Kenya and Nigeria. Um, he'll be followed by um, Alison Grande and Sarah Fisher who are part of a three person team um, Jamie uh, is also in the audience, um, and uh, they looked at um, Chinese medical teams in Ethiopia and Malawi. And then finally we have uh, David Landry, um, who uh, completed his research a few years back, um, but is uh, no less uh, still relevant um, on Chinese investments um, in Madagascar. So um, with that, uh, Xiaoyang. Uh, good morning, everybody. So see, <laughs> good to see you again. And uh, so I will start with the most archaic uh, sector, so the agriculture. And uh, so the agriculture cotton is an important uh, economic crop in uh, yeah, for the agriculture sector. And here we see first uh, a comparison of the productivity. So first, China we see ranked at the top three in the whole world, where uh, some African countries like Malawi, from Malawi to Tanzania, they are ranked uh, far behind. So this is the initiative uh, for me to do research on this sector to see whether this uh, productivity gap can be uh, uh, like uh, matched or yeah, can the Africans can catch up with the uh, Chinese productivity. And another thing related is to the, uh, the Zambia, especially the Southern Africa, they start to export, uh, uh, they got a lot of investment uh, from uh, uh, other countries. So since 2007, 2008, 
They just uh, uh, had a train uh, restructured their cotton sector. Therefore, the Chinese, as well as uh, other foreign investors, they came to the country. Therefore, it is interesting to investigate uh, in uh, this uh, connection, like uh, uh, whether the foreign investor, uh, foreign investors, can bring the technology to yeah, raise the productivity in the country. And another thing is, uh, we also see the uh, Africa's uh, export of cotton uh, to China increases. Here, the black in the bottom, these are the like uh, volume of uh, Africa export. And then the gray ones up there, they are the export from uh, other countries to China. Most of them actually, the largest part is actually from USA. That's actually part of the trade deal. But anyway, the Africans, they still now count uh, like 10% uh, of China's uh, export or uh, import of cotton in general. Uh, so this is set the context of this study. Uh, and then we see in the sector of uh, uh, Zambia and Malawi, because why I choose this country together, because there's some uh, relations I will ex explain later, because some countries, they invite in both countries. And uh, then this cotton sector, they have, uh, uh, after the restructuring of the market by the uh, lo local authorities, they have in CC increasing in competition. And then especially rapid growth of Asian investors, including Chinese, Indian, and Singaporean. And also then we see some uh, trend is the, the big companies, uh, they have uh, more advantage. And then uh, production growth, uh, they varies in different countries. In, in Zambia, that's uh, relatively better. Uh, while yeah, some like Malawi and others, uh, they are uh, not influenced so much. Another thing is this uh, export to China, they are influenced by China's quota system. So actually the thing is that when you export uh, to China, you can almost guarantee profit because the price of uh, China's cotton is uh, more expensive than the international price because the Chinese government wants to uh, reset this uh, uh, higher price in order to protect its own cotton farmers. But then that makes uh, the uh, attracts a lot of imports. That's also why the U.S. farmers, they want to uh, get their uh, share in this uh, export to China's cotton market. But so therefore China set a uh, quota system administratively. And then uh, another thing we see the trend is the uh, foreign investors, they, in this connection, they then bring more processing capacity to Africa because uh, it's hard to compete with these uh, large U.S. Uh, exporters for the quota. Then they said, uh, at least we, if we process it, then we can export some like a basic, uh, this gray cloth, so the basic uh, fabrics uh, to the uh, to China. Then you can actually uh, hedge, uh, avoid this uh, quota system. And then uh, in the survey in 2016, which is funded by uh, Size Carry, uh, we, uh, I investigated, uh, did a survey of these uh, companies, different about uh, uh, five, nine gen generis, uh, gen uh, generis in Zambia. And uh, the NWK, that's a uh, uh, South African company. Continental, that's a part of uh, Olam. So it's uh, Singapore, but uh, with uh, uh, the Indian particip share participation. And uh, Cargill, as we know, that's a US company. But I, uh, yeah. And uh, then Alliance, that's a Kenyan company. And uh, Graphex, that's uh, Indian again. And uh, China Africa, that's uh, uh, Chinese. And AGDC, also a uh, Chinese. Then Majid Cotton, that's an uh, Indian company. And uh, the last one, MFGPC, that's a local Zambian company. But it was just a startup. And you can see its size is very small. 
So we see the Chinese, uh, they are just uh, medium-sized in the market. However, they are strong in their local areas. And here I give you a picture of how the, uh, this cotton business, uh, it's a contracting farmer, uh, contract farmer uh, business model. So we have uh, uh, the general manager, that's the Chinese, the, uh, and the country manager, they are in charge of business and especially the marketing export to China and other countries. They are uh, handling this. But under them, there is a Zambian agriculture manager who is uh, basically handling with all the production. And after that, uh, they have uh, four regional managers, uh, and they are all Zambians. And then they have uh, route managers this uh, for each region, like 10, 6 to 10 routes, and then after that, buyer. This, uh, 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 yeah, until buyer, I think, yeah, actually until the routes, they are the full employees of the cotton company. The buyers, they are just uh, like uh, farmers, but they are like contact farmers, and they get uh, some uh, like incentives when they try to collect uh, the cotton from their own village, but they are not, uh, con uh, they do not have an employment uh, contract. And uh, then this, uh, after that, it's uh, three over 30,000 farmers. And here is the cycle of each planning season. So first, uh, in the left side, they start with the training sessions in the seeding uh, season. In Zambia, it is uh, around October uh, this time. You see, they, I, I was there in July to, uh, and August 2016, so I didn't uh, have this uh, see, uh, see there uh, exactly uh, how, how they uh, did this workshop, only saw the pictures. And here is uh, like this American ballworm. These are the materials uh, used by these managers to uh, promote, to, to give these instructions to the farmers. But actually we see these uh, uh, materials, they are not really uh, uh, designed by Chinese. They actually are taken from different channels. Some are download, some are looked for by the local managers. So here again we see uh, after the general manager and the country manager, all the people below, they are Zambians. So only, they only need three or four Chinese in this agriculture section. Uh, so they actually, this, and also these managers, they do not necessarily know about agriculture. So therefore, with that, then this kind of materials, they are just uh, rather uh, designed or they are uh, prepared by the local, like a uh, regional manager and agriculture manager. And these managers, they got it some from uh, their previous training by the Ministry of Zambia or by FAO. And sometimes uh, there are cases that uh, they was uh, a manager of a previous cotton company and they even got some materials from other their previous work, etc. Uh, there must be some IPR issues, but however, every company is are doing this. So and uh, this is uh, not really uh, come to the like court yet. And here also we see the farmers, their, uh, their difference. Some farmers, they can even use uh, tractors. And while the other farmers, they just uh, use their uh, hand. Uh, yeah, so it's a very big difference. And then uh, with the collection, then uh, we see there are some like uh, just uh, use a cow uh, to pull the cart, but some uh, the use the uh, trucks. And uh, then the Chinese, uh, China, Africa, they are larger use uh, trucks. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of trucks. That's uh, one of their advantage. While a lot of other companies, they don't have uh, the uh, yeah, they just hire you know, other like uh, driver driving teams. And this is uh, the generally. And uh, here, um, 
you know, we also did a comparison between the China Africa cotton and the Cargill. Actually, the Cargill is much more difficult to access than the Chinese company, at least for me, but I believe for most people, it, the researchers, you may feel, have a very similar feeling. And uh, the, uh, yeah, because Cargill is well known worldwide for its uh, yeah, discreetness. And, uh, uh, here we see the difference of yield, average yield, and we see that the China the Chinese farm uh, company looks uh, kind of relatively lower. But uh, in fact, this uh, there's a lot of factors in uh, influencing that. So, for example, Cargill they have been there already for more than ten years, and they inherited uh, all the state-owned companies. Therefore, those farmers are relatively stable. While the China Africa, they face a large problem of side selling. So this we will see in the next slides. Here then the uh, Chinese, uh, I investigated uh, six villages of this uh, uh, China Africa's uh, contracted farmers. So here you see the number of contracted farmers on the leftist uh, column. Uh, but then we, yeah, this is how they recorded this, uh, like they, uh, when you have these farmers, they just uh, come to get the cotton seed, then it is uh, written down, this uh, counted as contracted farmers at the beginning of the season. And they have records, but in fact, when during the harvest season, you can see actually the number in this effective farmers are reduced, are smaller than the contracted farmers. Maybe sometimes only half of them, even like uh, one third of the original farmers, because a lot of these contracted farmers then they actually sold the cotton to other companies uh, during the harvest season. So I only calculated this uh, effective farmers when they really got harvested. Then we have average yield of the different villages, and we see actually they have uh, quite a different. Uh, uh, Youths uh, uh, in these uh, villages, but uh, one large uh, factor for this youth is actually the input. So how much loans they give to these uh, uh, farmers, and we see there's a uh, input also uh, different, yeah, varies among the villagers. And here we see some like a relationship of the input and the uh, yield. When you have more input, then you usually have more yield. But however, uh, we see the the company actually is not very happy necessarily with this uh, villagers or farmers with high yields because of, for the. the People who got more loans, they may not really repay these uh, uh, loans. Even they got a high yields, they may sell uh, yeah, uh, to other companies, or actually this uh, like uh, yields they cannot compensate the loans. So the loan recovery rate we see this with a very high uh, loan, like Village M1, it actually only uh, has a less than half of the loan is uh, recovered. So that's a big risk for the company. Company, and the company doesn't encourage that. Another, the last, this slide is just shows the difference between new farmers and older farmers. And uh, what we find is the new farmers, uh, they do not necessarily do worse than the older farmers. One reason, as we will see in the conclusion, it's about uh, the farmers, they actually move around between the companies <coughs> every year, and uh, most of them. But here, the, maybe the last uh, several slides is about the unique uh, business model of the Chinese companies. So uh, actually for the things before, Chinese companies almost uh, did the same. But after that, this is uh, some of their special business model. So they have this deleted cotton seeds uh, pro, uh, equipment, which is the first thing they introduced as the first one. And uh, uh, also then they use some of this uh, cotton seeds to like grow mushroom in their factory. 
And then they also uh, extract uh, oil from the cotton seeds. So this is along the value chain. And also then they later, last year, they established a textile mill, as uh, we discussed. They want to have this processing capacity. So they actually have this value chain production along the, based on this cotton business. And that's unique. Another uniqueness is about uh, every tech uh, uh, demonstration center. The picture was uh, done by Henry. <laughs> actually in this panel too. And he said, me that according to the yeah, material data. And here we see just uh, this uh, uh, yeah, agriculture demonstration center. That's a Chinese aid project in Malawi. But it is used by the, it's uh, uh, like uh, organized by the China Africa cotton. So they use that also for their business <coughs> in the whole region. So that's a combination of aid and uh, uh, business. OK, so finally to wrap up, it's, uh, so the generous foreign investors, no matter Chinese or the uh, other countries, they definitely have interest in promoting productivity. Because the more cotton they get, the more profit. And uh, but then they have also used uh, different approaches, like uh, extension training, so namely the 30,000 uh, farmers, how to train them and actually repeatedly. And also the Chinese think about uh, seed quality, this acid deleted seeds, agri-tech center. And they also then try to use the most cost-efficient chemicals, uh, yeah, this um, uh, methods. But then the model is still like evolves with the experiments. So they uh, actually we see the Chinese they adopt the local contract farmer system because in China they didn't have this kind of system. It's a purely local system. And uh, also then they, they are very cautious about the cost control as we mentioned. And they actually also welcome financial resources from various partners, from Chinese government, from China Africa Development Fund, and even uh, FA and the United Kingdom. And, uh, but we find another thing is uh, that the uh, impact is very limited because they, uh, one thing is they said, uh, as uh, the Zambian border of uh, cotton border said, uh, it's just uh, the company change at the uh, top. But actually, the farmers, they move around in uh, locally, a lot of side uh, selling. So actually, a lot of practice on the ground. It's very difficult <coughs> to change the farmer practice on the ground. It's uh, very far away. And uh, then uh, cotton farmers, uh, but uh, in comparison to other sectors, they got more training uh, because of these uh, private firms uh, and uh, this uh, liberalization of the investment. And uh, then uh, constraints of the outgrower scheme, as uh, Anna last uh, uh, yesterday asked, uh, what's the constraint? Actually, I said it's money, because the outgrower scheme, that's also uh, this model is established simply because the farmers do not have money. Therefore, they rely on the initial input of the companies. And uh, but that also makes the constraint. They depend on the farmers, and also the companies, then they think more about uh, risks rather than productivity election. While in China, they have a very different system. And uh, the Chinese farmers, they have enough uh, uh, capital capacity and capacity. They are more independent and entrepreneurial. And uh, then uh, in the end, this, uh, we see it uh, has a deal with the whole agriculture system in southern Africa. So actually, the tradition changes very slowly. OK, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and, and ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, first apologize for joining this uh, panel in due course. I, uh, I got hit by the aftermath of uh, the spring meetings, uh, where we had 80 meetings in uh, eight days. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I survived anyway. But, but, but really, apologies for joining uh, late. So we, we're going to move uh, straight to uh, Henry. Henry uh, to, to get that, and uh, Henry, you have 15 minutes to uh, give you your presentation. Thank you. Hello, good morning, and um, thank you so much to Diffid and the ERCRC, and uh, Deborah and Kari and Marie and uh, Jordan for uh, supporting me to do this. Uh, research last summer. Uh, this was done over two months, 
Uh, I spent a month in Nairobi, and then I spent a month in Nigeria, two weeks of which was in Abuja, and two weeks in Lagos. So um, although two months sounds like a lot of time, by the end it was feeling very, very rushed for everything that I wanted to accomplish and talk about. Uh, so um, I'll just start by briefly uh, saying what this talk is about and what this talk is not about. So this talk is about knowledge and technology transfers from Huawei to local Kenyan and Nigerian actors. Uh, it's not about uh, the PR crisis and the security issues that have been in the news for the last few months, but of course, those issues do relate to some of the issues that I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation. Um, so, um, uh, the outline of the presentation. I'm gonna talk about the context of Huawei in Africa, then I'm going to talk about what the purpose of these training centers actually are. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the opportunities for knowledge and technology transfer within this. Um, this picture has nothing to do with knowledge and technology transfer. I just saw this guy at a China-Africa trade fair in Nairobi, and I really <laughs> liked it. And so this is the only opportunity I get to use this picture in this presentation. Um, so uh, the African markets thing, I'm not going to bombard you with um, uh, slides like this, but just to give you a snapshot, the, the point is that uh, African telecommunications markets are some of the fastest growing in the world, and uh, the use of smartphones to talk about the growth of the telecommunications in industry is a useful uh, metric because uh, if people are using smartphones, it means they're using 4G. And if they're using 4G, it means that the telecommunications infrastructure has to expand to accommodate that. And so um, uh, uh, that's why a lot of um, people focus on smartphones. The uh, mobile revenue within sub-Saharan Africa is also expected to grow enormously by global standards in the next few years. So this is a, this is a big market that the big telecommunications companies are trying to wrestle their way into. And then just to give you uh, the second and last boring slide of uh, data, um, the, uh, I just want to give you a snapshot of what uh, Huawei's business looks like. They uh, really focus on three core areas, which is their uh, consumer business, their carrier business, and their enterprise. And actually, this is something quite unique within the telecommunications industry because um, Huawei does it all, basically. So the, the consumer business refers to uh, handsets, laptops, tablets, that sort of thing. And their main competitors are going to be people like Samsung, Apple, Techno, Oppo. Uh, and uh, these are all companies that exclusively work in the consumer industry. They don't do carrier and enterprise. Um, and as you can see, Huawei's uh, consumer business has been expanding over the last few years and continue to expand in 2018. Uh, enterprise, once again, their biggest competitor is Cisco. Cisco is a company that does not do handsets. It does not do, uh, or, I mean, it does the little handsets that you get in office telephones, but I mean, it doesn't do smartphones or tablets or laptops. Uh, and Cisco is also a company that isn't competing uh, for business with network operators. And then lastly, uh, Carrier, this is the business for network operators. The main competitors that Huawei is facing here are companies like Ericsson and Nokia Alcatel and Siemens once upon a time. Um, the only other company that also competes in all of these fields is actually ZTE, but ZTE or ZTE, depending on your pronunciation, uh, uh, are not uh, nearly as successful in Nigeria and Kenya and um, uh, they may be more competitive in some cases outside of that, but I'm going to be focusing on my case study countries. So, um, uh, Huawei has training centers in eight countries in Africa. Now, uh, Huawei also is said to have open labs in Egypt and South Africa, which are mainly supposed to be focused on uh, carrier business collaborations. Uh, whether the one in Egypt, ex whether either of these exist, I don't know. I wasn't able to confirm. They also have a joint innovation and enterprise 
uh, institute that was touted in Lagos. Uh, but if anyone else is working on this, I was able to go to the University of Lagos and can confirm that that never materialized, despite the uh, vast amount of fanfare that you'll find on the internet about that center. Um, so um, just to give you an idea of what these training centers look like, um, they're kind of what you'd expect. You know, you've got business meeting rooms that are all very flashy, and then on the left there, you've got a classroom where students can learn how to work with routers and switches. Um, and what you'll find is, I, I haven't uh, presented it here because there are only so many pictures of classrooms that you want to look at, but these look exactly the same as the training centers in Nokia or Alcatel in uh, Lagos, they look like the training centers that Ericsson has, uh, whether it be in uh, Nairobi or elsewhere. The point is, and the point that I'm going to make throughout this presentation, is that Huawei's training centers are nothing special, despite um, uh, a vast uh, amount of interest in them. Um, they are par for the course within the telecommunications industry. If you want to sell your equipment, uh, you need to have a training center through which to teach your customers how to use the equipment that you're selling them. Um, as regards the purpose of these training centers, <clears throat> uh, I had one very fortunate interview with the uh, PR manager of Huawei for East Africa, and he quite bluntly said, we are not in the business of technology transfer. We are a private company uh, we uh, guard our intellectual property. That said, we do focus on knowledge transfer, uh, both within the business and for CSR programs in the hope of expanding our business. Um, so this also backs up a point that many of the Huawei employees were making, which, which is that they have incredibly strict rules about how to defend their intellectual property. For example, in Huawei Kenya, there is sellotape over sing every single USB port in the company. If you put a USB device in a USB port in Kenya, uh, in Huawei, Kenya, it sends a signal to the central security system. You are then called to report to a senior manager. Your boss is also called in, and you have to explain why you needed to access uh, the USB <coughs> port for, um, for anything in particular. Um, and, of course, there's the risk of getting fired as a result of this. Uh, I mean, they have very, very strict uh, security measures in place to make sure that their intellectual property is not stolen or violated by uh, employees leaving or so forth. Um, so, in terms of numbers, uh, Huawei... Uh, so, Huawei... Sorry, I only got two pictures of the training center. But Huawei Kenya employed, uh, sorry, trained 1,000 people in 2017. Uh, this is apparently one of the biggest training centers in, um, uh, in Africa of its kind, according to the manager of the training center I was talking to. Uh, and they really focus on three groups of people. They're focusing on customers, which is, for example, uh, network op operators that are buying their equipment, people like MTN or Airtel. They're focusing on subcontractors. These are the people that Huawei employs to install its equipment and manage its equipment, and I'll talk more about them later. And the third group that they train are channel partners. Again, I'll talk more about these groups later, but channel partners are effectively independent companies made up of network engineers, maybe five to 10 to a team, and uh, they will uh, work explicitly on delivering enterprise projects for big, oh, sorry, for big institutions. Um, so um, uh, I was not able to confirm what proportion of this 1,000 students was made up of the customers, subcontractors, or channel partners, uh, because I was told that everybody that came through the training center was listed on a handwritten ledger, and it would be very time consuming to go through, and I wasn't allowed to look at the ledger. I find it weird for a super high-tech company that it should all be handwritten. But anyway, the, those are the main three groups. The last group, which is a very small part of Huawei's business, is CSR. And this is university students and high school students. And this is all about you know, developing management capacity. This is all about um, um, you know, having them, giving them an exposure to Huawei 
uh, in the hope that one day they might be future customers or that they, it might further their studies in some way. But you know, this is, this is really CSR. Um, and I would be amazed if it made up more than 5 to 10% of their business. CSR programs, some of them don't work out. This was a training center I went to in the University of Strathmore in Kenya. Uh, this is now just the general IT center for the university. Uh, Oliver, there on the right, manages the IT for the university. Uh, but it's got absolutely nothing to do with Huawei anymore. The, the project folded. And, and this has happened with a few uh, of the CSR projects. But the business is up and running. Um, so uh, while we're on this slide, I'm just going to uh, talk about the opportunities for knowledge and technology transfer that do exist. And I'm going to focus on the enterprise business and the carrier business. And then I'm going to finish with a little bit of good news stories from the CSR side of things. So uh, one of the key differences between Huawei and its competitors is that uh, Huawei has covered the costs for a number of training programs uh, as it enters the Kenyan and Nigerian markets. So for example, in the enterprise business, Cisco being the number one company, um, Anybody that knows anything about Cisco knows that you have to go through a lot of certification to get anywhere near qualified so that you can then deploy, uh, yeah, deploy Cisco equipment. Um, uh, usually you'll do this through university courses, but you can also pay, pay for it yourself. Uh, and as you get better and as you become a more experienced you know, independent channel partner, uh, you may pay for higher certification so that you can de deliver bigger projects to bigger institutions. So one of the channel partners I spoke to, for example, uh, recently was hired to, him and his team were up, uh, hired to upgrade the um, network for one of the biggest airline companies in East Africa. And it was determined that Cisco's um, uh, current network was, was old fashioned and needed upgrading. So were they going to go with Cisco or were they going to go with Huawei? Now, <coughs> Huawei trained him and his teammates for free, specifically so that they could, uh, so, so that they would be able to pitch Huawei products to this customer. In the end, the customer picked Huawei products because it was deemed to be of a comparable level of um, technology. Um, and it was cheaper. And that was, uh, and that was the end of it. The, the other thing that he was saying about Huawei is that they'll always put a lead engineer in your team to help you as you design products. They'll also sit down with you for days preparing bids for big institutions. These are two things that Cisco does not do. Once Cisco has trained you informally through its uh, academy programs, online programs, you're on your own. So he was saying this was a huge benefit. However, the flip side of that was he also said there are a number of occasions where uh, the Huawei lead engineer has then uh, leapfrogged from that introduction to the customer to then cut out the channel partner and work with them directly. And apparently, this is what happened with Safaricom and a couple of other big contracts. The second opportunity for uh, knowledge transfer is the carrier business. So um, uh, one of the inspirations for this research was Jun Sun's work on South Africa, who was uh, Dr. Fu's, uh, I can't see you in the audience, uh, Dr. Fu's uh, master's student. And um, Jun Sun talks a lot about the shift towards managed services. Uh, this is basically this has become big business for all the carrier providers like Ericsson and Nokia Alcatel. Back in the day, talking like 10, maybe 15 years ago, African network operators would do end-to-end -end services. They would do everything. They would own the base stations. They would, build the they would buy the transmitters from Ericsson, but then they would install them themselves on the base stations. They would manage the transmitters, uh, and they would have enormous teams. Um, basically, the uh, telecommunications industry took a hit. Um, after the financial crisis, and a lot of the network operators started focusing really just on data delivery and services. So they started outsourcing a lot more. Now, managed services is the name given to when uh, a company like Huawei or Ericsson or Nokia Alcatel has sold uh, its transmitters to the network operators. They can then uh, make sure that that technology runs smoothly for the following two to three years. So they'll sign a contract for two to three years. Um, and just because you made the technology, it doesn't mean that you have to be the person responsible for managing those services. So for example, uh, to give you some numbers, uh, uh, MTN in Nigeria, 55% uh, uh, of their equipment now is Huawei equipment, 25% is ZTE, and 20% is Ericsson. Five years ago, 
it would have uh, Ericsson was uh, a much bigger share of their equipment, and uh, they originally divided the managed service contracts between uh, Ericsson and Huawei. Uh, in 2015, they've gone completely to Huawei for all of their managed services. Same story with Airtel. In 2016, despite 50% Ericsson, 50% Huawei, in 2016, they, they moved all of their managed services to Huawei. Uh, the other reason managed services is big business is because it's a platform. So if you install the transmitter, you can set it so that it's not at full capacity, so that if you get more people that move into that geographic area <coughs> and they demand more service, Huawei well, we can say, oh, we'll sell, you, we'll sell you the extra bandwidth for whatever, you know, hundreds a month on that particular base station. So it's a, it's a really lucrative area for all of these businesses. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, of the 2,500 people that Huawei Kenya employs, uh, only two or 300 of them are core employees. The other 2,200 roughly are all subcontractors to install these, uh, uh, these products and manage them. It's all managed services. So just to finish, that is really the, uh, the other exciting area of managed services, that uh, a lot of these small firms that are being subcontracted by Huawei now <coughs> are able to go it alone and work directly with the... Uh, network operators themselves. And the Huawei engineers I was talking to were saying that they think this is the future of, um, uh, of the business in those areas. Um, there's no time for the good news stories, really, but they're less exciting. Uh, I was able to do a survey of 51 students who'd been on Huawei CSR training program. And the PR manager was obviously very helpful and very kind. And, uh, and uh, most of the students are saying that uh, the Huawei training has been useful in some shape or form. Um, uh, yeah. So um, I'm just going to conclude on that and basically say that training is inextricably linked with sales, and this is true for any telecommunications company. Secondly, Huawei currently offers more free training than its competitors in a bid to increase its presence in African markets. And this business strategy seems to be working. Uh, and then finally, I would just leave you with a question, which is uh, if uh, African telecommunications markets are expanding and that infrastructure is expanding anyway, um, is it necessarily a product of Huawei's entry into the market that there is this increase in jobs and job opportunities, or could that be the case with any telecommunications company? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. From uh, Cotton in Zambia to uh, Telecom in Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, we now move to Ethiopia and we'll be discussing uh, medical, uh, the medical uh, uh, teams. Okay. Um, Alison, over to you. You've got 15 minutes. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming, and thanks to Carrie and uh, everyone involved for that. Um, I'm Sarah Fisher. I'm a PhD candidate at Georgetown University, and together with my uh, colleagues Alison Grande and Jamie Sayer in the front, uh, we did a project entitled Chinese Medical Teams Knowledge Transfer in Ethiopia and Malawi. So as you've been hearing about for the past day and a half, and just in general, China is sort of best known for investment in sort of tech-heavy sectors, such as infrastructure, manufacturing, transportation. But they also, of course, provide uh, investment to social sectors, such as education and health. Um, and so our project, our project focuses mainly on the health sector. Um, and Chinese health aid is sort of primarily focused on three different kinds of things. The first is construction of health facilities, so malaria centers, hospitals, things like that. So for example, uh, the picture that you see here is um, Tiranesh, Beijing, which is a Chinese-built hospital uh, about 25 kilometers outside of Addis Ababa, where we did our research in Ethiopia. Um, they also do 
provide things like medical equipment, supplies, medicines. These are often attached to sort of the incoming Chinese medical teams, which is their third uh, form of health aid, which is essentially sending teams of medical specialists to various hospitals um, in African countries to sort of assist with the human resources for health problem. And so, of course, these sorts of investments in health can be sort of uh, juxtaposed to the traditional development assistance for health, which is more sort of project-based. So to do this, we are going to ask, what is the extent of knowledge transfer, skill diffusion, and technology transfer between Chinese medical teams uh, and local medical staff? And we did this in both Ethiopia and Malawi. So to answer this question, um, we conducted a qualitative uh, comparative case study um, in two countries, as mentioned, Ethiopia and Malawi. Um, so in Ethiopia, we focused on Tiranesh Beijing Hospital, which, as I said, is about 25 kilometers outside of Addis Ababa and is a Chinese-built facility. And then in Malawi, the team is actually split in half, um, and half of them stay at Kamuzu Central Hospital, which is uh, the kind of main central hospital in, Lil in Lilongwe, the capital. Uh, and the other half goes up to Mzuzu Central Hospital in the northern region. Um, which is also a central hospital, but was actually built by the Taiwanese, um, although it runs as a, as a Malawian central hospital, so there's not really sort of Chinese or Taiwanese influence there anymore. Um, so in these, in these three hospitals, in these two countries, we conducted mainly in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with a bunch of people from, of course, CMT members, um, as well as local medical staff, doctors, nurses, hospital administrators, um, and even sort of government, government officials at the both national and regional levels. Um, so this is the sort of main intro to the project, and I'm going to pass it off to Allison, who gets to talk about all the fun findings that we had. Hi, my name is Allison Grande. I am currently with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Um, I graduated from SITES last year in May, so we had the opportunity to do this research last summer in Ethiopia and Malawi, and we had about four weeks to conduct all of our interviews. So it was a pretty quick, pretty quick fieldwork stint, but I think we learned a lot. Um, so I figured I'd start by talking about our, our very first day of field work. So we arrived in Ethiopia, we figured we'd go to Beijing Tiranesh Hospital, see who we could talk to, try to get in touch with the CEO. We show up and it just so happens we are invited as honored guests uh, that afternoon to the handover ceremony between the Chinese government and the Ethiopian government of phase two of this hospital that the Chinese had built. So Beijing Tiranesh Hospital was built in 2012 by the Chinese and handed over to the Ethiopian government. About 15 um, medical practitioners who were Chinese stayed on for a year, and thereafter Chinese medical teams have been coming through. But this phase two was just opened this summer, um, and it's kind of just a second building next to the main hospital that has the cafeteria, dorm rooms, some office buildings. But it seemed like a really big to-do when we were there. So we were really excited. We felt like the guests of honor. When the Chinese saw us, they thought that we were journalists and were so excited that more journalists were there because you could see how much they wanted this to get out in the world, that look what we are doing. Um, so anyway, we get there. And as you can see, there's two photos here. The first is... Um, of Ato Admasu, sorry for my pronunciation, Babe. Um, and the second is the, ambas the Chinese ambassador, Tan Jian. And so two important quotes I wanted to share that, that really got us excited about the start of our fieldwork. The first on the Ethiopian side is when he stated, the handover inf infrastructure does not mean that support to the hospital from the Chinese will end. Knowledge and technology transfer is a very important aspect of this cooperation. So from the Ethiopian side, they view Chinese medical teams as a, as a way for a skill diffusion and knowledge transfer um, over the long term. And then on, on the Chinese side, the ambassador said, this is a handover and not a handoff. The software is equally or more important than the hardware. So this was really encouraging for us, and we really felt like we would see um, evidence of knowledge transfer and capacity building through this program. <coughs> And this is just a quick agenda of what we'll go over, but due to timing, I'm just going to skip over that. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I wanted to just give you a quick overview of the process of the CMT program and how it usually runs. This is not necessarily specific to either Ethiopia or Malawi. There's a few details, but it's pretty high level. So first, there's the agreement. There's an MOU between uh, China and the other the other country. Um, chi the Chinese government in most MOUs supports the salaries, um, the accommodations, the living expenses. So they, they fund most all of this. Next is the selection process. So uh, with Chinese medical teams, there's a twinning program. So each province is paired with a specific country in Africa. Um, in, this case, the, um, in this case, in Ethiopia, they're paired with Hunan province. And the Malawian team is paired with, paired with Shanxi province. Um, so the provincial government, that Ministry of Health, selects which hospitals in that province will participate in the program. And then within the hospital itself, the medical leadership or hospital administration will select physicians that are a part of the Chinese medical team. And so what we've heard is that these are either assignments or sometimes people volunteer for those. And then each team consists of about 14 to 15. I've also heard 16 physicians. Um, and they always are accompanied by one translator who is only there for activities of daily living. They are not in the hospital to translate at all during work, t work time, which is surprising a bit, um, as well as one chef. So the Chinese teams only eat Chinese food. They eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, and which is interesting, but we got to share a meal and it was actually really good, so they have good food. <laughs> um, next is preparation. So on the Chinese side, the Chinese medical teams, once they are selected, prepare for three to six months and they get to take off work. So they are not working during this preparation. They are just training. They're doing English training, cultural training, learning more about local diseases that, that they may appear in the countries where they're going, as well as national guidelines of those countries and how they can operate there. Um, also important to note, this English training is taught by a Chinese teacher. They are not taught by a native English teacher. Um, and then lastly, we heard from some CMTs that they had to pass an English exam to become part of the team. On the African side, once the CMT is selected in Ethiopia, the, um, the process for obtaining a local medical license to practice there starts immediately. So information is sent over, and the medical license process is started. Um, these CMTs are also added to the staffing plan of the Ministry of Health, so they are considered full-time employees. Next. Process is next part of the process is the arrival. Donations enter duty free. About one to two weeks of overlap between the the prior CMT team and the new one coming in, so they can learn the ropes from them. About three months of orientation. This varies, but in Malawi, this three months is very important because the difference here is that during this time, Malawi and local medical staff observe the Chinese doctors to see whether or not they are qualified to obtain that medical license. And if they feel that they are not ready to practice autonomously for any reasons, they will not submit a letter uh, to the government that says they can practice on their own. So this orientation can be short, it can be long, uh, depending on the department and the physician overseeing them. And then is service. So right now service is one year. Um, so we started off by saying how at the high levels of government, it's stressed that knowledge transfer is a large part of this program. So we wanted to look at the actual documents, the memorandums of understanding, to see if knowledge transfer education is a part of the program itself. And it is. It is in both Ethiopia and Malawi. In Ethiopia, um, the, the MOU is comprised of several different healthcare activities where the CMT program is just one of them. But as you can see in blue, there's academic lectures, on-site demonstration and training, and it's also there from the Malawi side. Um, the Malawian MOU is only for the CMT program. They have other MOUs for other healthcare activities. Um, but something to note, we, didn't, we were not able to actually get our hands on the MOU. They were confidential. They didn't want to give them up. But we had a Ministry of Health official summarize, uh, in Ethiopia, summarize that MOU, and then in... Malawi, we had two different, um, two different officials kind of give us uh, an overview of what, the, what is in the MOU. Okay, so I have to go faster. So these are the main pro program expectations of the CMT program. They're meant to serve as a human resource, an educator, and a, and a donations agent. So these are, the, these are core to the program. After we found out with our research, two main aspects of their roles as a, as a CMT don't actually happen all the time and, and happen more infrequently than not. So, and we, we've identified a few areas, reasons as to why. 
As we've heard through other lectures, language barriers, number one, the lack of equipment and technology, absence of program management, and change in program duration from two to one, two years to one year. So basically, the challenges involved with performing the core responsibilities of the program are inherently barriers to knowledge transfer, because if they can't perform as a doctor in these places, they can't, they can't provide knowledge to their peers. So this is qualitative, but this is just based on um, our interviews with, with staff, uh, local staff and the CMT. We, we point out that language skills are the main barrier to knowledge transfer. Um, so basically, there's the inability to actually perform if you can't speak English. These doctors can't, they, they are not able to go into the wards to do rounds. They can't interact, interact with patients. Um, so basically, in Ethiopia, they are counted as a full-time staff member, but if they can't operate, Ethiopian Ministry of Health then has these lists of staff that are not functional, which is, which is a problem. And if you're not performing, if you're not, if you're not you know, operating, if you're not going around seeing patients, your local peers are not going to learn from you. Next is du the duration of the program, switch from two years to one year. It takes time to acclimate. If you cut that down to one year, after you get acclimated for six months, you only have six months to actually perform. Six months later, local staff have to go through the whole orientation process again, which detracts from the time of the locals who are already short-staffed at these hospitals. Lack of equipment, CMTs are sent over, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and they often can't do surgery because the equipment needed to do neurosurgery isn't there. So it's an, an a, entire human resource is just wasted. They either go and work at the embassy or they stay in the residence all day or they refer patients to other hospitals. And then lastly, absent program management. We found that there is no one in either country that oversees the program. It's implemented at the Ministry of Health down to the Regional Health Bureau. So all of the administrative stuff gets done, but there's no process, there's no feedback me mechanism, nothing to, to improve the program over time. And it's been noted, for example, with language skills, that it's been going on for 10 years. We've seen articles about this over and over, and nothing has changed. OK, so it's, there's issues. But there's also some successful knowledge transfer that we have seen, which is based primarily on language ability as well as, um, well, due to the language ability, as well as the, the discipline. So those disciplines that are hands-on, where you can demonstrate a procedure and people can observe, um, are much better at, at knowledge transfer than those that are cognitive disciplines, such as internal medicine, that require you to discuss a patient and discuss the outcomes, et cetera. So this is just a chart of the frequency of the modes of knowledge transfer, those that occur the most and those that um, are the least frequent. We found that although formal training programs were a part of the mandate, they don't happen, really. One or two instances that we found. Um, and we also found that trainees are those that benefit most from knowledge transfer because uh, local physicians don't have the time to to shadow the the CMT. So the trainees do, and it's good for them. They're they're learning. And um, for example, at Mizuzu Hospital, they have over 300 uh, visiting students a year, a huge residency program. So they are exposed to the CMTs at um, a, a lower, more junior level. Traditional Chinese medicine is also very um, big in Ethiopia. It's very accessible. People love it. They travel 600 kilometers from around the country to get there to get acupuncture. Um, nurses are being trained in it. So it, this is a really positive addition to, to the knowledge transfer. Technology transfer, didn't see much. Only thing that we saw was in the anesthesiology where new methods were introduced with the equipment that was brought over specifically because this one CMT was able to speak English really well, and so he, could, he saw what was needed and he was able to fill that gap. Another positive that, that through this program is that even though there's no formal training in Ethiopia or Malawi, we see in both countries that these programs, where, where the hospitals where the CMTs are located, are conduits for training in China. So it's much, much more likely that doctors, nurses have the ability to go and train in China if they are at one of these hospitals where the CMT programs are. And both administrators said a lot of their staff do go. Um, it's usually short-term training, one to three, one to three months, um, and they. The reason why there's the Great Wall in the background is because a lot of that training is cultural sightseeing, which I thought was interesting. Um, have to wrap up, CMT experiences. So there's a few similarities here. They, most CMTs are a lot less stressed in both Ethiopia and Malawi. They work mainly half days. Um, they prefer one-year tours over two-year tours. 
And just a main point between Ethiopia and Malawi is that in Ethiopia, they are um, much happier. The CMTs were much more open to speaking with us rather than those in Malawi. We believe that's because the English level in Malawi was a lot lower than that in Ethiopia. They also just arrived, whereas the Ethiopians were there for almost a year. They were finishing their tour, so they were much more, more um, integrated. Language level was, the language level of Ethiopia we saw allowed them to be integrated more into the host community and build relationships. They had social functions outside of work, whereas this did not happen in Malawi. Lastly, in Malawi, their residents were about six kilometers from the hospital. So every day, no matter what, they would get in their car at lunchtime and leave. And so they never had the chance to just go and interact on a, on a regular basis. Um, lastly, diplomacy in the Malawian side was a lot larger. The role of diplomacy in the CMTs, they were in those... They didn't yet travel to the other hospitals, so they were all in the long way, right near the Chinese embassy. And so that meant a lot of them spent time doing diplomatic work. Now I have to wrap up. Just lastly, you'll see, so this is comparing Ethiopia and Malawian hospital administration and medical staff. You'll see that there's a lot more red on the Malawi side than the green, red indicating negative experiences versus green positive. So why, why is this? We believe that it's, there's a few different reasons. The relationship with Ethiopia goes back much longer. There have been many more teams that have been to Ethiopia. This is the 20th team versus the 6th in Malawi. So the process has, the kinks may have been ironed out. Um, also in Malawi, um, the actual, the CEO administrator actually said, which is one interesting quote, where he basically called the CMTs tourists. He said, we know it's for international relations. Everyone knows they're here for international relations. As long as they're here, they don't have to be working at 100% capacity. Whereas in Ethiopia, we, the administration basically was complete positivity. And it was interesting, this was right after this handover ceremony. Who knows if they have to tout the line of, this is great, they're giving us so much money, everything's perfect, bright and shiny. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but, the, um, but overall, the experience was more positive in Ethiopia. Lastly, key takeaways are that the CMT program has a positive impact on patient care with some degree of knowledge transfer and skill diffusion. The role of diplomacy associated with the program is a core priority, which, was, uh, which we did not know at, at the beginning, but it's, it's really important to them. There is a disconnect between the rhetoric of the Chinese government and implementation on the ground, so is Dave Lampton's implementation problem. Although it's stated that knowledge transfer is so important, by the time it trickles down to grassroots, CMTs told us, oh, no one told us we had to train. We are just here to help people. There's a huge disconnect between the PR and, and what they're told. And then lastly, with several modifications, financial and human resources provided by Chinese for the CMT program could be leveraged for dramatic gains in overall effectiveness. If a few things were changed, which we don't have time to go over now, the amount of resources and money that is spent could actually improve healthcare outcomes in these countries if the Chinese did it the right way. Um, so. That is it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. Now, uh, we're going to move to the last but not least presentation. Uh, David Landry will be uh, discussing uh, agriculture and, and skill transfer in Madagascar. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Landry. I received my PhD from SAIS about a year ago now. Um, I just want to note this is a paper that I've co-authored with uh, Yunnan Chen, who's here in front, and for her sake mostly, because uh, she would have had three presentations if, if she was up here, uh, I'll be presenting for us. Um, I'd like to thank Deborah, Yoon, Marie, and the whole Kari team um, for putting this together and uh, letting me present. And um, this is the second year in a row that I have the very last slot of the Kari conference. And <laughs> it's either an honor or it's just I'm very thankful that they managed to squeeze me. <laughs> um, all right. Oops. Here's the clicker. All right. So um, our research uh, took place in the summer of 2015. So Yunan and I spent a, about a month in Madagascar uh, in July and August of that year um, and conducted interviews with um, roughly 20 firms. So um, I'll introduce the, the project a little bit more in depth, um, outline our research questions, methodology, and then our main findings. Um, 
So we looked at the Chinese investment flows in Madagascar, uh, especially after the 2009 crisis. So um, for those of you who don't know, there was a coup in Madagascar in 2009. And um, following that, there was a dramatic change in the patterns of FDI coming into the country and also the makeup. Um, so we also look at the skills and technology transfer implications of these investments, Chinese investments in particular. And um, we also explore the challenges that were faced by Chinese investors in Madagascar. All right. So our re research question is, can Chinese investment foster technological spillovers and skills upgrading in low-income countries? The case study is Madagascar, and as I mentioned, it was about 20 uh, 2025 20, in-country interviews, and we visited 10 firms that we confirmed were Chinese. Uh, I'll get into that later. It was kind of a, a fun game of uh, tracking down Chinese investors in the country. Um, so a little bit of background on Madagascar's economy. There's, you know, huge uh, swaths of very uh, productive land for agriculture. Um, also a lot of cheap labor. Uh, but very limited capital and technological <clears throat> stock. Uh, so as you could expect, then the, the main sector is agriculture and then services because of the construction sector. Um, and then some mining, that's quite a recent addition, um, at least in, in large-scale mining. And then some agri uh, manufacturing. As I mentioned, there was the political crisis, which kind of had huge impacts that still reverberate in Madagascar's economy today. Um, so this is uh, the number of new investments by origin in Madagascar. And this is a, actually quite an accurate list in terms of the background of the investors. Um, so as you can see, in 2009, there was quite a dramatic uh, decrease in the number of new investments. Uh, <coughs> so that's you know, newly registered firms in the country. Uh, this slide doesn't quite show what I want to show, which is here. Um, so the number of investments by, by various countries actually declined dramatically, except for Chinese investment. So after the crisis, whereas a lot of, um, of Western firms kind of retreated from Madagascar, um, the proportion of Chinese firms increased and the number of Chinese firms investing in the country increased as well. Um, so this information was provided to us by a former um, finance minister, and it was very useful in, um, in kind of getting a macro idea, an idea, an idea of what was going on at the ma macro level. Um, but then the list of um, Chinese firms at the, you know, specific Chinese firms and where they were based that was given to us was much less useful. Um, so I'll just give a, a little anecdote. So we had a list uh, from Mofcom that we started with that had 22 firms. And then at the Institute of Statistics, they gave us a list of 54 <laughs> firms. Um, and then there was a bigger list of every firm that had ever invested in Madagascar that was supposedly from China. And some of them, the investment, for actually for the vast majority of them, so like seven or 800 out of 1,000, the investment figure was less than $10 US. So, so it was just kind of placeholder values. Um, so we looked at those three lists and then uh, compared them and then tried to find the, the firms that were in common and decided to visit those. And there was one day where we went, uh, it cost us so much in taxis, but we ended up visiting about 10 firms or something and only two or three of them were actually Chinese. So we went to some firms and they were, you know, they were puzzled by the questions we were asking. It turned out they were Japanese or, <laughs> or <laughs> Korean and then, there was one firm where we finally thought, oh, we have a Chinese firm, and they, you know, we've established right off the bat that they're a Chinese firm, but then it would turn out that they were actually from Mauritius, and uh, <laughs> they considered themselves Chinese, but they weren't from China. So for the purposes of our research, it was <laughs> of limited utility. Um, so in the end, we identified 11 new firms uh, that weren't on either of the lists, and then we also uh, confirmed five firms that were on all three lists that we had. Um, so it just goes to show how, um, how inaccurate the information that we had to start was. Um, so just a little history of, um, of the Chinese engagement in Madagascar. So the first wave of Chinese in Madagascar um, came more than a century ago to work on uh, Chinese railways. 
And um, there's still, that's kind of the, ba that's been kind of the backbone of the Chinese population in Madagascar. Um, and then in the past few decades, there were new waves of Chinese migrants that would come to work on uh, development projects. And those two categories together are referred to as the old Chinese. But in reality, there would be the very old Chinese uh, who consider themselves Malagasy, the old Chinese who kind of juggle those two identities. And then there's the new Chinese um, who came in Madagascar for, um, as part of commercial ventures um, since the go-out policy, so you know, in the last decade or two. Um, so the main clusters of, sec of Chinese investment that we identified are in agriculture, mostly in cotton and rice produ uh, production. Um, there's growing investment in large-scale mining, but that's not, not something that we really looked at. Um, but it would make a fascinating case study if anyone uh, wanted to spend time in Madagascar and, and conduct research. And then there's growing investment in the light manufacturing sector, so especially in garments, textile. Um, and some of the geographic clusters uh, around Antananarivo, so around the airport more specifically, there's quite a big enclave of uh, Chinese investment, a few free trade zones. Um, in Taliara, so on the southwestern part of the island, um, there's a growing cluster. Um, it's kind of a mix uh, in terms of light manufacturing, some fisheries activity, um, things like that. Uh, Mahjanga and Nozi Bay um, are two places that we didn't really visit. Uh, but from what we were told, there were significant clusters of Chinese investment there. Um, so the three kinds of um, skills and technology transfers that we identified that we wanted to delve into um, are backwards linkages in manufacturing, production inputs, which turned out to be more in the agricultural sector, and then training. Um, so first, uh, for backwards linkages, um, we found that that was very limited. Um, we didn't identify even a single case where there were true backwards linkages to local firms. What would happen instead is that um, Chinese <clears throat> firms would turn to other Chinese firms and take their inputs in the, in the production cycle. Or in some cases, uh, they would just integrate vertically and just you know, start another company that would then supply what they were doing. So there's one great example of um, a gentleman who founded a company, he got to Madagascar in 1998 after working on a development project, decided to start a company and got a thousand hectares of land um, and um, eventually decided that his business would be um, seafood exports. So he now um, uh, started uh, live seafood exporting and he makes his own um, um, foam, styrofoam containers, uh, charters flights directly to China, so, um, and contracts um, fishermen. So basically, he, he has his old business virtu ver vertically integrated, but doesn't really subcontract any local, um, any local companies. And then that same gentleman, because there's nothing that goes as well with seafood exports than cement production, he decided that he was gonna start his own cement production factory. And um, so he, I think it's because of his business contacts and other um, Chinese firms, and they cited the lack of access to cheap cement as an impediment to business, so he decided to start that, to fill that gap. Um, in terms of production inputs and uh, in the agricultural sector, we, we noticed quite a lot of that. Um, and it was mostly in two distinct ways. So first, there was um, a lot of Chinese equipment that would get imported. And, um, and in some cases, tailored to local conditions. And then a lot of local farmers would then adopt that technology. And um, from what we were told, would, it would make their activities more productive. Uh, the second one was in terms of uh, high yield hybrid seeds. So um, uh, Hunan Yuan, which was, it started off as an agricultural technology demonstration center and as a development project. Um, uh, brought hybrid seeds to Madagascar, and they were so um, so popular that they would run out of supply. But then eventually they started having distribution problems because 
uh, the distribution would take place through the Ministry of Agriculture. And um, there was a lot of demand, um, but the, they couldn't really meet that demand with the existing um, distribution networks. So now they're still there and they still run that demonstration center and they also uh, run some training, which I'll get into after. Um, and there's the same new biotechnology that gets brought in for the cotton production. Um, in terms of on-the-job training, um, there was some, um, it, it ranged quite widely between companies. Um, so in the, the case of King Deer Kashmir, which is the, when we went, might have been the largest pl Chinese plant in Africa. It employed about 5,000 Malagasy workers. Um, in their case, they have a training program that's quite structured and takes three months. And uh, in, in, for digital um, uh, sewing machines, it, it's actually about six months. So they had very little turnover because of the, because of the amount of training uh, that their employees would get. And, and as a result, most employees were employed almost permanently. <coughs> um, so that was one very successful training program from what we, uh, from what we witnessed. And then in the agricultural um, sector, there, both in cotton and in rice production, there was some training. So for example, Tianli Agri, which is the largest um, of the three cotton producers in Madagascar. It actually started as a, uh, with mills and production in Mauritius and then decided to secure cotton from Madagascar um, because it was closer and apparently the, the quality of the cotton in Madagascar is amazing. So they had 15 training centers kind of sprinkled around where the main um, transformation center was. Um, so they would train farmers in using the, their um, specific seeds and um, on planting techniques. Um, and then uh, the same for Hunan. Even they would eat, uh, Hunan in the rice production would even train farmers to, in the use of seeds that weren't their own hybrid seeds. Um, so when we went, we got to visit that training center. And um, in both cases, they seemed uh, quite productive. Um, and then um, one of the companies, actually, one of the cotton companies, we <coughs> asked them about training, and they assumed that we were talking about the training that the Malagasy were giving them. And uh, there was a bit of a miscommunication, and it turned out that they'd bought their facilities from a, uh, from a Japanese firm that had folded. And um, that firm used American sewing machines and knitting machines. And the, the Chinese investors had no idea how to make those run. So they had to keep all the labor force and put, in, put together a training program where the Malagasy um, workers that were already involved previously would then train the Chinese workers that had arrived. Uh, so I guess training both goes both ways. <laughs> um, so the main challenges that we heard uh, from the investors um, were really the political environment and the lack of support that they felt that they'd received after, especially after the 2009 crisis. Um, and there was one case where the, the following election after the 2009 crisis was in 2013, and um, there was a firm that we met that had invested $1.8 million in an uh, abattoir, so like a slaughterhouse for, uh, for cattle and the training center as well. And it was kind of a package deal that they'd agreed with the Ministry of Li Livestock for. And in 2013, when there was a whole cabinet shuffle, um, their license was revoked and they perceived that it was because they refused to pay bribes. Um, but that was, you know, that political instability and in that case, uh, potential corruption uh, made the investment environment quite unpredictable. Um, and then, you know, uh, some infrastructure bottlenecks were there as well, and that kind of explains why there was such a cluster around the airport, because it would make exporting to China much easier than having to navigate the roads and the railway system. Um, and then there, was a problems, there were problems that were cited uh, with the financial infrastructure, but we didn't really get into that. Um, and then again, labor relations. Um, and then our finding, in, on the institutional front was that there was little strategic vision um, in the Malagasy government 
to foster technolo technology transfers. So they, they were trying to attract FDI and had um, special economic zones that were put in place, but there was little um, skills and training and technology transfers didn't really play, like figure prominently in their policy strategy. And um, in some other cases, um, you know, in Rwanda and Ethiopia, it, it seems like there's a much more uh, cohesive strategy, which we didn't really see in Madagascar. Uh, so yeah, so in, in conclusion, we find evidence of skills and technology transfer, especially in training, uh, but other channels of backward linkages are pretty much absent. And then the policy environment has played a role in, uh, in stunting the, the FDI. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, David. Um, friends, we have, we have heard uh, a, an extremely you know, wide range of papers, but all focusing on, on covering uh, the, the modalities of technology and knowledge transfer to, African, to Africa. Um, one thing I would probably want to say before I open the floor for questions is that one of the reasons why this session is so timely is because um, at the World Bank we do believe, for example, that uh, you know interaction between uh, China and Africa would yield the, the the highest benefit if it leads to an empowerment of African population, job creation in Africa that would definitely lead to poverty reduction. Um, in terms of uh, job creation, Africa needs to create one million jobs per month to face just the new entrance on the labor market. This is a daunting challenge, and any uh, firm investing in Africa should definitely uh, bear that in mind and provide uh, you know, the training and the skill transfer needed for Africans to not only have a decent and productive job, but hopefully create your own jobs and employ other Africans in the future. In fact, that's critical for poverty reduction. What we know is that although we have seen a, uh, a, we have seen a decline in poverty rate in Africa over the past two decades, we have actually seen an increase in the number of poor people in Africa because of high population growth. <clears throat> In fact, the uh, population rate, uh, the poverty rate has uh, declined from 54% in 1990 to 41% in 2015. So there are progress, but the number, the absolute number of poor is actually increasing. So dealing with poverty would require job creation, high quality job creation uh, in Africa. And one thing that is absolutely clear to me, listening to all the papers here, is that um, you know there is some level of technology or skill transfer, knowledge transfer, and I'll just give you one uh, example, one anecdote I personally uh, experienced visiting Ethiopia twice in a year, uh, two years ago. I uh, went on the uh, Addis Ababa metro, and the first time I went on the metro, the Chinese were driving the train, and the Ethiopian were standing observing. Six months later, when I came back and rode the train again, the Ethiopian were driving the trains, and the Chinese were standing observing. To me, that was the clear proof of some skills transfer that has taken place. So it's clearly taking place in some form and in some uh, sectors. What we have heard today is, you know, depending on sector, it may be completely cosmetic. It may look actually like techno technological transfer, but actually not much is happening. But in others, we are clearly seeing some, uh, uh, some change. So um, I would like to open the floor here and, uh, you know, take a couple of questions, um, you know, and... and, and and, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion, but probably let me kick off using or abusing my privilege of, of chair of this session to ask one question to all panelists. I would probably want you, when you respond to the, the questions,
to elaborate a little bit on the role you see technology playing in, uh, te in, in skills and knowledge transfer in the respective sectors or areas you have discussed. What we've uh, noticed clearly is that, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with, with broadband uh, penetration increasing in Africa, there is actually an opportunity to use both the telephones and also use uh, technology to in increase the uh, potential of learning, including for uh, populations that are not that literate. So if you could elaborate a little bit as you answer the question as to what role you see technology helping uh, or uh, a, a digital, uh, uh, the digital uh, revolution in Africa being helpful to actually boost uh, knowledge transfers. Thank you. Let me open the floor. We'll take a couple of questions. Yes, please introduce yourself and make your question extremely brief since we are running a little bit behind schedule. Hi, uh, Yunan Chen, um, SAIS PhD candidate. Uh, my question is for Professor Tang, uh, and it's on a specific slide that you showed of the different villages, and there's a huge diversity in the loan repayment rates for, for, for these cotton investments. And I was wondering if you had any uh, theories on just why you see this, this diversity in compliance and what, what cultural or economic or political factors might account for that. Thank you. Um, Franco Urban from KTH and SOAS. Thank you very much for your really fascinating presentations. I have a question to Henry. Um, this is like a very high tech sector and I think it's really difficult to go from production capabilities to innovation capabilities. And I'm just wondering how a country like Kenya can really build up their innovative capacity in that sector. And whether you're seeing anything like joint ventures or joint R&D initiatives or if that's not happening yet, whether there's any planning for this to happen in the future. And if not, that how can innovation capability be built up in different ways here? Thank you. Right here in the middle, yes. We'll go from left to right. I'll suggest we take all questions in one go and then allow the panel to uh, answer in, in one go as, as well. Yes, please. Um, can you tell incoming sites, IDEL PhD? Um, so question for Sarah and Alison. Um, you mentioned that they did do something like every team received language training. A language barrier still um, accounts for the major impediment for the technology transfer. What was wrong? Thank you. There's, there's two more questions on this side and then we move. Yes. Thanks for the fascinating presentation. Zena Busman with the World Bank. My question is for Henry. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, there's a distinction between uh, technology transfer and uh, knowledge transfer and Huawei tends to do the, the latter, uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, my question, and similar to what I asked other panelists yesterday, is uh, to what extent does this compare with what non-Chinese firms are doing, especially when it comes to technology transfer? Uh, so, you, so Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little. You mentioned Cisco, for example, when it comes to the enterprise services they provide. Um, do they do any technology transfer in terms of, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the training that they provide to their subcontractors. Is there any evidence of that? How does that compare with what Huawei is doing? Okay, there's one question, the last on this side. Yes, and then we move to the right side. Yes, okay, please. Thank you, um, Dane from Harvard. Um, uh, my questions go to Professor Tan. So in one of the slides, when you compare uh, the operation of China, Africa, cotton, and <coughs> cargo, um, it's very interesting to see that after 2012, there was a significant downturn in terms of the yield and the number of subcontractors that both companies had in, in, in the country. And I wonder if you have any explanations for that downturn, um, what factors may have caused that. And the second question is, um, have you seen any efforts at the industry, in industry level, any self-regulation in terms of the issue of um, site buying or site selling that you mentioned? Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the right, from the back to the front. Can you start? Yes. 
gentleman in the last uh, line. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ibrahim Akoy. Uh, I am wondering whether you actually compare companies that were supported by the Chinese uh, and the companies that were local and whether the, the Chinese investors uh, uh, whether the companies that were supported by the Chinese were actually more productive in, in, in agriculture sector compared to those that were not supported by, by the Chinese. Did you see the, because the problem we have in most of Africa is the low productivity in agriculture. And I'm wondering whether the Chinese supported uh, agriculture sector was a little bit productive compared to the other se sector. Which Thank you not. very much. Yes. Uh, thank you, Hong Zhang, PhD candidate from George Mason University. So one takeaway I from I have from this panel is really uh, the level of technology or skill transfer has to do with the uh, the level of business opportunity in the specific sector. So on the one end of spectrum, you have Huawei who pr provide free training because there's business to be made. On the other end, you have the medical sector mm -hmm. and the, the doctors, the physicians are just there and they don't have any prospect of making any money. That's why they don't really do technology or knowledge transfer. So I wonder, taking that, what would be the implication for African governments when they try to convince the Chinese to, to transfer technology and knowledge? What kind of incentive they should be building into the program? Thank you. Thank you very much. On this side, one last question. Hello. I don't know if it's morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I have a company called Segeros International Group. We focus on agriculture, rural agriculture. At the World Bank IMF meeting, we talked more about uh, sustainable infrastructure and investing in people. Looking at the rural areas, apart from cotton, what infrastructure are you basically looking at from the rural area up to the urban area? Because that's where most of the farmers is, apart from uh, cotton. And uh, apart from that, do you have any other development investors like schools, clinics, what other development do people do there to help their communities? Uh, that's agriculture. Uh, IT, IT, we have M-Pesa in Kenya. I think you saw how technology M-Pesa is doing in Kenya. And uh, now we are coming up with FinTech, blockchain, lab tech, and all those other uh, technology, digital. Is that going to bring confusion into the local people or into Kenya or around the world? Thank you. So Thank you. Very good. Um, we have a wide set of uh, questions here. What I'm going to suggest, you know, to make sure we uh, finish uh, <coughs> roughly on time, is to ask you to s answer in two minutes each, and uh, that would ensure David is not the last one to speak. <laughs> and uh, you know, I will have uh, that uh, privilege to speak last. And my name is Zufak, so I'm used to speaking last. <laughs> so, let's start. Right from okay, the beginning. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so first about this uh, diversity uh, between the village uh, loans, uh, the main uh, key agent for that is the buyer, which uh, is responsible to collect a loan and give uh, seeds uh, in every village. And I think in the China, Africa, cotton, and also most of the new cotton companies, they have uh, problems uh, to recruit uh, uh, and also train the buyers. While the Kagyu, in general, they have uh, like uh, experienced uh, and also stable buyer. Uh, so this buyers, so this uh, buyers, uh, they are uh, <coughs> their capacity actually decides. And uh, also about the yield downturn, down, uh, downturn. Uh, that's main, uh, also uh, related uh, by uh, to the climate change. And uh, I think that's the yeah, drought uh, in these years uh, was the main reason for this. Uh, and it's actually across the board for the whole, uh, for the whole industry. And uh, uh, regarding side uh, uh, selling, then uh, the government uh, doesn't have a very <coughs> effective uh, policy, but it's rather this generous. They organize the uh, uh, board, uh, or they organize uh, like a, a chamber of, uh, uh, yeah, chamber 
Chamber of Commerce, something like that. And uh, they actually try to regulate uh, themselves, among themselves. And uh, it's okay. They can, uh, although the side, uh, side selling cannot be totally banned, but uh, they can live with that. And uh, regarding the rural facilities, these uh, companies, uh, I think the ma uh, major one is this uh, agriculture uh, demonstration center, which is actually an uh, aid project. And uh, the, the company actually is just an uh, implementer of this aid project. <coughs> it has also some uh, like a social responsibility program, uh, like uh, give uh, some uh, food uh, or uh, to help uh, the uh, local villages to repair some buildings, but that's a small ones. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Is it, um, is it Sarah or Alison? It's Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, so I'll respond to the, the second question on incentives a bit. So I think um, it's true, of course, like in the medical sector, you don't necessarily have money to be made, although we have seen things like traditional Chinese medicine and specific kind of drug supplies that come from China where there's an entrance to markets sort of thing. Um, and so that might, that might help. But also, um, if you think about it more from sort of like a development assistance standpoint rather than an <laughs> investment standpoint, in theory, the, the purpose of programs like this is to become sustainable, right? And to be able to leave and exit at some point. And if you don't do any of that kind of skill transfer, I think, in the health sector, you're never going to be able to leave. You're never, your program is never going to be sustainable. You'll be sending doctors the end of time. Um, so I think in part that's a, that's a, that should be an incentive for knowledge transfer in the medical sector. You want to answer the other one? Thank so, you very much. Yeah, go ahead, please. Continue. Yeah, so as far as the issue with the language barrier and, and training, so um, it's only they only get six months of training. They're in China. They're being taught by a Chinese teacher, English. So being six months is not enough time to learn a language fluently to be able to interact with a patient. And if you're not immersed in the environment where you're learning, it's even more difficult. And I think that that, that just shows that there's not an emphasis from the Chinese government side of caring enough to make sure that the CMTs are being able to work effectively. However, yes, they, they don't care enough to work effectively. And I believe that it may show that this is kind of a this is kind of a diplomacy. This is kind of a PR move rather than wanting to actually make an impact. Or maybe they do want to make an impact, but it's not the priority, as we've seen by a few of the other choices of this program. Thank you very much, David. Um, to respond, the best response I can give to uh, your question about um, how whether the Chinese support in the agricultural sector has been more productive is um, in the case of uh, Hunan Agri, um, the yields per hectare, I just looked at the paper now, um, before their demonstration center was set, was apparently two tons, so two tons per hectare of, uh, of, uh, in rice plant plantations. And uh, apparently after the whole, in, um, for, with farmers that received the whole package of both training and hybrid seeds, the yields apparently uh, grew fourfold to eight tons per hectare. So it's a, quite a big difference, but I'd be curious to know what you know how much can be attributed to the to the seed specifically, and how much to the training. And I, you know, there's probably a good uh, randomized controlled trial in there somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, so so the short answer based on our research is that yes, there seemed to be a big uh, productivity difference. Excellent. Henry? Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, just quickly to answer uh, your question about uh, the role of tech playing in, in skills and knowledge transfer, absolutely. Like, I, I think there is uh, this virtual cycle of, uh, with increasing demand for um, um, mobile communications, there is an increasing uh, production of infrastructure. And that means that, for example, people who want to be Cisco engineers or Huawei engineers can actually learn some of these courses online. Uh, and, and continue to fuel that growth. Uh, in answer to Frauke's question about uh, uh, Kenya building up innovative capabilities, joint ventures, uh, there was one um, really interesting example of a guy called John Tanui, who came into Huawei as a, a graduate engineer um, you know, at the bottom level, became the deputy CEO of Huawei Kenya, and now manages Konza Tech City, which is the big um, uh, sort of 2020 vision of uh, telecommunications development and IC and general technology development and 
in that campus, they're building a city for that campus, there's also a joint venture with uh, Korea's foremost technological campus, uh, and I can talk more about that afterwards. Uh, for Zainab's question uh, about um, differences with, uh, between Chinese and non-Chinese firms, um, Cisco <coughs> has uh, really traditionally been very um, market-driven. I mean, it's still the market leader, and it has a, a monopoly on this. Um, they, uh, their training is also market-driven, and um, they, they expect it to remain so. There was one interesting anecdote I got from a, a third-party training institution in Kenya where um, when uh, this institution was set up as a pan-African initi initiative for uh, ICT training for uh, all Anglophone African uh, students, and the center has traditionally trained almost exclusively in, in Cisco technologies. When they found out, when the Cisco representative found out that they'd started introducing Huawei training, they called up this institution to tell them that Huawei was copying them and accusing them of all sorts of things. Uh, so they have a monopoly and they'd like to keep it. Um, uh, but um, Huawei is a is a, a legitimate competitor and, and uh, uh, they also provide different opportunities in terms of career progression uh, compared with, say, Ericsson and um, uh, Nokia Alcatel. A lot of the Kenyan and Nigerian engineers that I spoke to who worked for Huawei uh, specifically mentioned that Huawei was better for early career development because they had they employed more people. Um, but then for later career benefits, uh, it was better to move into Ericsson and uh, Nokia Alcatel. And then lastly, uh, M-Pesa and uh, these new software opportunities. I mean, they're, um, they're, they're an opportunity, if anything. They're, they're, there are lots of young uh, uh, students who are now um, making the most of, of working in the, the opportunities of software development, uh, specifically in, in universities like University of Nairobi or uh, Strathmore, where they have a whole campus dedicated to software development for big companies. Excellent. I know I'm standing between you and lunch, and uh, between you and Debbie, which uh, you know is uh, you know uh, extremely important. Let me just give you uh, takeaways uh, from my perspective from this session, um, and from the papers presented in this section. In this session, I think it, what is clear is uh, China's engagement in Africa is. Uh, is, is, is extremely uh, diverse, is touching all parts of Africa, but it's also very new. So we need to emphasize, as we discuss knowledge or learning, that we need to also emphasize dual learning that needs to take place. Chinese and Africans need to learn to know each other, learn to actually work together. I think that's uh, that aspect of knowledge, and one of the papers, I think, was uh, Sarah, who mentioned, or Alison, who mentioned that knowledge, uh, the learning is actually going both ways. So it, 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 emphasizing that, uh, you know, um, uh, double-way learning is, is certainly something we, we need to continue uh, emphasizing on. The second takeaway uh, from, uh, that I took from, from uh, David's uh, fun game of uh, tracking Chinese firms uh, is, is that of data, the need for African countries to actually build data sets that would really allow us all researchers to actually do meaningful work. You know, most of the time what we call Chinese firms are actually not Chinese firms as we have learned in one of these papers, or, or they probably do not exist or they do exist in a, in a sector that is not what is uh, actually recorded. So there needs a, to be a big effort and I know Debbie and the team here in Cary have definitely pioneered uh, some of that effort in, in data collection. But, you know, the earnest is on our African countries to actually take statistics more seriously, invest in it, and collect the right and appropriate information to allow us to uh, better understand these issues. The third, uh, you know, takeaway from my sense is the notion that uh, knowledge transfers, IPRs are always contentious, mean, you know, be it between China or Africa, uh, China and the US, or Europe and, and the US, it's always contentious. So we cannot just assume it's going to happen automatically. One of the papers mentioned the lack of coordination, both from the African and the Chinese side. I think 
you know, emphasizing the need for an institutional framework for knowledge transfer to take place is clearly one of the things I'm taking away from this discussion. It's not just going to happen, you know, automatically. And one of the reasons it's not going to happen is because you cannot just expect private firms, private sector companies with pro pro proprietary information to just give it away without any clear framework for uh, for for exchange or for or for transfer. Um, the, the last, um, uh, but 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 not least, what I'm taking away from this discussion is that we still have a lot to learn. We need to continue, uh, you know, researching the mechanism of technology diffusion, technology adoption, technology and knowledge transfer in Africa and especially between Chinese uh, firms and African firms, but also Chinese uh, workers and African workers. Because that's clearly how we see at the World Bank, we see the link between those investment and poverty reduction. Chinese investment in Africa would allow, would help, you know, uh, eradicating poverty if they lead to more job creation in Africa, but if they lead to more upgrading of African workers so that they can actually become more productive and earn an income level that is clearly above the poverty level. With this, I would like to ask you to thank the panel uh, for wonderful presentations, and thank you very, very much. Over to you, Debbie. Thank you. That was a great summing up, and I'm delighted because I think in many ways you summed up, Albert, our entire conference. And so I don't need to do anything, which is wonderful because I really am the one standing between you and lunch So let me uh, just take advantage of my time here at the podium to issue a huge thanks. And my thanks are first and foremost, as always, to my team, my people, Marie, in particular, Yoon, Jordan, the students who have been out there manning the tables and have done so much work in the background to make this conference happen beautifully. As you know, there's always so much that goes on. But also our teams that have been part of this research project for the past five years. And our funder, our main funder for this research is the Department for International Development and the Economic and Social Research Council. So I hope you're as delighted and proud as I am in the outcomes of this research, which have been presented over the last two days. And to also thank the Carnegie Corporation, which supports us, and we have uh, someone from Carnegie here today, so which supports us in our administration, and several of the researchers whose work was presented today were also funded by the Carnegie Corporation. So I would, I would love to actually spend 45 minutes <laughs> on all of the key things that I learned over this. But you'll have to stay tuned and watch our website for our summary of what happened here. And if you didn't get to all of the sessions, we have it all recorded. So you can watch any of it um, on our website. So I encourage you to do that because it's been rich over the last few days. So with that, let me say thank you. And lunch is in the back. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say we get my <laughs>